It's been 10 months since we caught this child predator in Los Angeles, California. This is Fernando Arteaga, a 32-year-old man who showed up to this house in Los Angeles, California on April 16th, 2023, to meet up with what he thought was a 13-year-old girl for sex. Thankfully, there wasn't a real child here, but instead, it was the teams of Skeeter Jean, Courtney Elizabeth, and Trilogy Media to confront Fernando face-to-face. Now, if you've watched our channel in the past, you've probably seen us confront many predators and scammers face to face. But unlike other cases, today we have concrete updates about Fernando's criminal charges, juicy ones. This video is f***ing wild and will most definitely be demonetized on YouTube considering the subject matter. So please watch the video to the end and leave a comment below if you want to help us out. It's quite rare that we get to be involved in the legal proceedings that follow our catches. Since we're not cops, we're not lawyers, we're not prosecutors. We are content creators out to shine a light and expose the dark corners of this world for your viewing entertainment. But Fernando Arteaga being put in handcuffs is not the end of this story. Quite frankly, it's just the beginning. In this video, we are going to show you exactly what happened since Fernando's worst day ever, including his charges, testifying as witnesses, enduring witness intimidation and verbal abuse by Fernando's public defender, all the way to a hearing of my own in front of the judge facing criminal contempt of court charges and possible jail time, all because I wanted to protect myself. This is an infuriating story about justice, corruption, and the true work involved behind the scenes of putting a predator behind bars. Does it have a happy ending? You'll get the entire story by watching to the end of this video. This is a bumpy ride, so buckle up. And welcome to Trilogy Media. I'm going to be vulnerable right now and admit to you that this is a very difficult video for me to make, both emotionally and technically. Emotionally, because it involves not only heinous crimes of a man trying to prey on children, but while trying to seek justice, us and our collaborators, our friends, face unjust verbal abuse and threats at the hands of a power-drunk, egotistical, arrogant public defender who has taken his job well beyond the line of attorney misconduct. And technically, because the video proof that shows you the true extent of this public defender's unethical practices was basically stolen from me. Court ordered to be deleted under the threat of criminal contempt of court charges and possible jail time. I am dead f***ing serious. Now rest assured, even though those videos are no longer available to be posted, you're still going to learn every single thing that transpired right here in this video. But if there's anything that anyone takes away from this video, just for the sake of protecting all of us, I am hereby stating for the record that every statement made and every word spoken in this video is opinion-based and not meant to be taken as factual. This video is not a call to action to anybody for any reason. This video contains only the personal opinion and testimony of each person that is speaking. This video is not defamatory, slanderous, nor any form of libel. Defamation requires a statement to be false, but purported to be fact. None of our statements are false, and all of our statements are opinion-based. Our statements regarding the actions, motivations, and or intentions of any of the players in this video, including but not limited to Judge Serena Murillo, District Attorney Jury Kim, and LA County Public Defender Michael Lambros, are not accusatory nor meant to be interpreted as fact. These are our opinions and our verbal testimony of what we experienced. This all might be overkill, but considering that I'm naming names and putting people of judicial power on blast, I need to make it very clear that we seek nothing from this video other than to tell a story from our perspective. So, with all that in mind, let's begin our story of catching a child predator, testifying to his conviction, and witnessing bullying, verbal abuse, undue burden, and witness intimidation and threats done by sleazeball public defender Michael Lambros. Throughout the entirety of the court case against Fernando Arteaga, public defender Michael Lambros has gone out of his way to threaten and intimidate Courtney Elizabeth and Christopher. He has created thousands of dollars in undue financial burden to them. He has repeatedly bullied them before and after trial hearings and even put warrants out for their arrest for no reason whatsoever. He has called all of us to our faces in a court of law, boneheads, dumbasses, scumbags, thieves, and kidnappers, all based on a stinghouse confrontation of a child predator that we all facilitated back in April of 2023. I'm gonna cover every single detail and what led up to it 
right now. And I'm gonna show you in painstakingly explicit detail why I believe Michael Lambros is a completely unhinged, immoral, arrogant, pompous circus clown of a lawyer who should be disbarred immediately. But how did we get here? I think the best place to start is by laying out all of the facts of the initial event, the sting. You may or may not have seen this original video before, but regardless, stick with me here. By taking you very briefly through this video, I'm gonna update newer viewers as to what transpired with Fernando and why he came to this house to begin with. I'm gonna debunk some of the common criticisms that we've received from some of the lower IQ viewers and disprove the unfounded, baseless, and false accusations made by Michael Lambros himself, all in one fell swoop. Back in April of 2023, Fernando reached out to Courtney's decoy profile on the Whisper app with username Yada Hockey, where Courtney immediately identifies herself as a 13-year-old girl named Kristen. Fernando made the first contact, as they always do in our stings. Not only does she inform her age immediately after the conversation starts, Fernando acknowledges this by saying, wow, you're young. So. He read it. Double your age. Are you cool with that? She replies again, saying she's 13. And he, for the second time, acknowledges this by saying, you're a kid. Despite acknowledging this twice, he continues the conversation by asking her if she's ever had a boyfriend, if she's single now, and even asks for a picture. She sends one, and he responds, acknowledging her young age for the third time now by saying, too bad you're so young. Hmm. Well, I guess that was only a deterrent for one hour and 16 minutes, as he couldn't resist asking her if she was a virgin. She affirms, and after a short back and forth driven mostly by Fernando, they switch off the Whisper app and continue via text message. Then things get creepier. He asks if she's alone, sends her a photo, and acknowledges for a fourth and fifth time that she is both underage and just a kid. And now Fernando turns up the heat a bit. Are you looking for friends or something else? She reminds him of her inexperience, and he continues to pry for reasons reasons as to why she hasn't passed first base. She says, I don't know, just never done more. Do you want to? Do you auto-please yourself? How often do you do it? Didn't take much longer for Fernando to pull from the all-star predator's handbook by asking, are you a cop? Then reminding himself, for a sixth time, you're a minor. Then he throws this clever line in there. We're not doing nothing illegal. Even if we ignore the ironic double negative there, one could argue that this is a common grooming tactic while simultaneously trying to preemptively protect himself. He says he doesn't want to get in trouble, but then he heads over to her house anyway, showing concretely what his intentions and priorities truly are. And it's here that our original video starts, with this very intentional disclaimer saying that all suspects are innocent until proven guilty in a court of law, which is true. Thankfully for us, the court of law has happened, so keep watching to the end. They have a couple phone calls together while he's in transit. Fernando said he's coming straight from work and might need to shower first, but he wasted no time in accepting the child's offer to shower at her house. After some block circling and predator perusing, we have Horny Henry here in person, ready to get down and dirty. Hi. You just come from work? Yeah, yeah nice. I know, well, we can you can shower. So now we get into the meat and potatoes of the actual confrontation, starting with the world's most awkward first date. No, no. Sure. Yeah. If you want, yeah. You know what? Yeah. Well, I was wondering if you could make, like, I got stuff for mimosas if you want it. For what? Mimosa. Uh, yeah. He again asks if she's a cop. You're not a <laughs> cop. No. He confirms her age for a seventh time, <laughs> an eighth time, and a ninth time. Yeah, yeah. Holding? Yeah. Actually, just let's just save some time. I'm gonna montage this. Here's every time Fernando acknowledged that she's underage and that he's doing something he shouldn't be. Your parents on on trip? You know, I come. I don't know. You're a minor, but yeah, I'm alone or what? You're not afraid. I can get in trouble. No, no. Sure. Yeah. I just kind of scared to see your name. You're not a girl. I should be more nervous. Why? I'm scared. Put in your. For the cops? I'm not just. Are you cool? Hold on. Yeah. Big time. Nobody's here? Oh, that sounds good. Can't trouble. Is that a trap? Is that a trap? No. Are you sure? Mm-hmm. Got a hand. 
Okay, now time for nakeds. Just for starters, for those that make the argument that we forced him to be naked, forget not that he willingly took off his own clothes in front of a minor with the door open. Privacy wasn't exactly on his wish list today. He continues to not only fully expose himself to who he thinks is a minor, but he touches her. He guides me into the hallway. I, I just start like backing up. He touches my hips. <laughs> Sorry, it's so uncomfortable. Invites her into the shower and insists that she stay close by while he scrubs between the cheeks. And finally, after what felt like an eternity, like the Kool-Aid man, we burst into the bathroom to confront the scum of the hour. Oh, look what we have in here. Just before capturing this haunting audio from Courtney's microphone once she was finally able to drop the live decoy act. Oh. You touched me. Come here. I got you. I got you. I got you. Yeah, I know. We then invite him to exit the bathroom and have a seat on the couch. For those making the argument that we forced him to stay naked, or as you'll hear Lambros put it later, robbery, use your f brain for two seconds. We're dealing with criminals whilst a crime is being committed. Us keeping his hands off of his clothes isn't so much about embarrassing him, although it is pretty fucking embarrassing, as much as it is to protect us. We don't know what kind of weapons he might have in his shirt or pants pockets. Letting him grab onto his own clothes now being faced with this new situation at hand could be very dangerous to everyone involved. And guess f what? He did have a weapon. He had a goddamn knife in his pocket. You feel bad that we all saw him naked? He got naked willingly in front of a child. Get f real. Also, not to mention, we did allow him to cover his genitalia, which if you're reporting for the decency police should be well and plenty. And trust me, that cup had a lot of unused real estate in it. If we had given him a Borat thong, would you still be complaining? It would have done the same thing. You can wear those in public. Even if he did feel as though additional coverage was needed, he had a pillow next to him the entire time that he never touched. My guess is that he concurred that the purple cup coverage was more than adequate. So now we're at the couch and we're doing nothing more than asking questions and ridiculing his dick. I know a lot of people took issue with that, but honestly, Fernando's feelings are the absolute least of my concerns. People in the comments seem to care more about that than he did, so cry me a f***ing river. If you take the position that we kidnapped him, as Michael Lambros accused us of, you are dead ass wrong. First of all, kidnapping is the completely wrong term to use here. So even if you were right while being wrong, you'd still be wrong. The crime of kidnapping involves forcibly or by other means instilling fear, moving someone from one place to another moving someone, typically another country, state, or county. We didn't move him anywhere. We never touched the f He walked into this house willingly, and his move from the shower to the couch was done completely on his own with zero physical contact from any one of us. And you know what? Yeah, I'm sure he was scared. But you being scared doesn't qualify as an accusation of someone instilling fear in you. When I go to the gym, which is never, I get intimidated, even afraid, you could say. But I can't accuse Planet Fitness of instilling fear in me to move my ass on the elliptical. The term you might be searching for is false imprisonment. False imprisonment is the unlawful violation of the personal liberty of another. In other words, forcing him to stay using violence or the threat of violence, neither of which even remotely happened. And to take it a step further, one could argue that a citizen's arrest would have been valid here, which would legally allow us to restrain him. Now we've never gone down that road, but I'm just trying to put things into perspective here. California Penal Code 837 states that a private person may arrest another under three circumstances. One, for a public offense committed or attempted in his presence. Two, when the person arrested has committed a felony, although not in his presence. Three, when a felony has been in fact committed and he has reasonable cause for believing the person arrested to have committed it. All three of those things are true. All three. So even if we did hold him, which we didn't, we'd still have a very strong case either way. All we did do is ask him questions while reminding him that we are not law enforcement. He is free to go. No one's holding him here and that he's welcome to explain himself to us or to the world if he so chooses. So finally, after a shitload of crocodile tears and about 150 dick jokes, the cops finally arrive and take Fernando into custody. We spent the majority of that afternoon working with LAPD who handled the situation 
beautifully. Officer Battles, you're a badass. They collected all of the recorded phone call evidence, gave us electronic links to upload screenshots of the chat logs. Yes, that's a f thing. Surrendering our phones is unnecessary and complete nonsense. And we found out the following day that the DA was going to charge Fernando. Mission success. Now, most times when we do stings like this, if we're fortunate enough to have a cooperative law enforcement agency that takes action, our involvement stops there. It's out of our hands as journalists and into the hands of the district attorney of the jurisdiction where the crime was committed. In this case, LA County. I'm Courtney Elizabeth. This is my camera person, Chris, and we confront child predators on YouTube. We've been friends for a long time. Almost 12 years, um, and then we became partners. Uh, how it started was he was the only one of my friends that wanted to do this with me, and he went to school for editing, so it ended up working out pretty good. Working with Trilogy has been awesome. The first time it was just Courtney, and then a couple months later, January 2023, when I got to meet you guys, it was awesome. And Cut. where are we sitting now? We're sitting right next door in another sting house. Fernando happened to be a predator that we caught in April of 2023. He came straight from work uh, thinking he was meeting up with an alleged 13-year-old girl. It was me. Somehow he believed it. He actually stripped down, got naked in the shower, cornered me in the hallway, touched my hips. He was naked the whole interview. We told him multiple times he was free to leave and um, just, you know, he just, he never left. Fast forward from April to December 2023. Courtney and Chris both received subpoenas to appear here in court to testify in the case of the people of the state of California versus Fernando Arteaga. They were subpoenaed to appear in court at 8.30 a.m. at the Clara Shortridge Fultz Criminal Justice Center at 210 West Temple Street in Los Angeles, where they would be sworn in to provide testimony in direct examination by the district attorney representing the people, as well as cross-examination by Fernando's public defender, Michael Lambros. Fernando was facing two felony charges, one for meeting a minor for lewd purposes and another for attempted unlawful sexual intercourse. His trial came up and we were subpoenaed to testify. Only Chris and I though, not Skeeter Gene, not Trilogy Media, um, who were a big part of that catch, just Chris and I. One of the district attorneys in Los Angeles County subpoenaed both of us to come out. At first we kind of assumed it'd be everybody, Skeeter Gene and his crew, Trilogy Media, but no, it was just us, but we were happy to do it. They explained, yep, we're gonna pay for it. And they walked us through every step as far as, you know, here's your plane tickets, here's where you're staying. The detective on the case actually picked us up at our hotel, took us to the courthouse, and we were ready to testify against Fernando. The detective gave us $300 each. <laughs> For it food. Was, it was a good, exper a good experience. Um, then we, you know, went to court to testify against Fernando, and um, although Chris was subpoenaed as well, he never got up on the stand. What you're about to see is a visual and audio reenactment of the court transcript from December 14th, 2023. The court transcripts are public record, but for our case of telling the story in a video, the voices have been re-recorded and some statements have been trimmed down or removed for time. But everything spoken here was taken directly from the court transcript, word for word, with true chronology. This right here is a preliminary hearing. There's no jury here. It's kind of like a mini trial where the prosecution is presenting all of the evidence to the judge, who will then make the decision whether to move forward with the charges or to dismiss the case. Before court even started, we met a man named Michael Lambros, who was the public defender for Fernando. And he met with us very quickly when we got there, shook our hands, he seemed really nice. He did, he did seem respectable. It's like, okay, he's defending this predator. Everyone, do, you know, they have rights uh, to, uh, you know, for a defense. So we weren't mad about that. And then things, things took a turn pretty quickly. It's Michael Lambros's job here to poke holes in the prosecution's evidence and to try to convince the judge to dismiss the case. That's his job as the public defender for Fernando Arteaga. But take notice during this hearing how Michael Lambros tiptoes quite a bit far past the line of defense and into a realm of introducing completely false and uncalled for accusations, criminal accusations, against Courtney Elizabeth and Trilogy Media. And don't worry, I'm gonna chime in throughout this and poke even bigger holes into literally everything he says here. Calling the matter of Fernando Artiega, this is case number BA514120. 
Mr. Artiega, please feel free to come forward and sit next to Mr. Lambros. We have Mr. Artiega in court with us. He is not in custody. He is being represented by Mr. Lambros. The people are represented by Mr. Bradford. Are both sides ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. Now, even though Lambros hasn't completely morphed into Lamb Gross just yet, the slime that is his conscience is already palpable to everybody in the room. The court was at 8.30. We were there at 8.30. We met Michael Lambros pretty quick. 9 o'clock came, 9.30. We're sitting there waiting and waiting, and it turns out Michael Lambros is busy in other courtrooms. Uh, we eventually break for lunch, and we don't actually get called into the courtroom until 2 p.m. Okay, thank you. The people may call their first witness. The people call Courtney Elizabeth. This part is direct examination, and that's Mr. Bradford speaking. He's the district attorney on the day. He doesn't represent Courtney, but he's on her side. He represents the people, the ones trying to convict Fernando. I finally get called into the courtroom. Chris could not join me because he is a witness. Uh, they want to keep us separated on the stand. Understandable. Um... But yeah, I, I took the stand. May I have you please raise your right hand and to be sworn. Do you solemnly state that the testimony you may give in the cause now pending before this court shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Go ahead and have a seat, please. On April 16, 2023, at approximately 6.20 p.m., were you at Los Angeles, California, County of Los Angeles? Yes, I was. And do you see anyone in court that you came in contact with on that date and time? Yes, I do. Can you point to them and identify what they're wearing? White and blue thin plaid button-up and a black polo underneath. Okay, the record will reflect that Courtney has identified Mr. Artiga. On that date and time or prior to that time, how did you come in contact with the defendant? He hit up my decoy account the day prior on an app called Whisper. And what is- Objection. Foundation. Okay, sustained. And what is Whisper? Whisper is a social media app where you post, uh, you, you don't have to post your picture or anything, and then uh, you can respond to the post or contact people through there anonymously. And did you receive an anonymous uh, or a hit from an account? I did, yes. And do you know the name on that account? Something Hockey Hada or Yada Hockey, I believe. And the contact you received from the Yada Hockey account? Did you eventually have a text contact with that person? Yes, I believe my second message uh, to that account was, I'm 13, is that okay? And it was shortly switched to texting where I used an app called Text Now to communicate. Okay, so on the initial contact, did that person ever identify themselves by their name? Yes. And what did that person say their name was? Fernando. And you indicated on that text or on that app that you were 13 years old? Correct. And did this individual respond to that? Yes. What did they respond? Uh, I believe, oh wow, that's young, I'm double your age. And during that text contact, was there other messaging back and forth? Yes, there was. And what was the nature of that message? This account asked uh, if my 13-year-old decoy account was single, asked her about masturbation, how much she masturbates, uh, you know, called her cute, uh, discussed that he was worried about police and getting in trouble. And at some point, did you send a picture through the account at the request of the individual? Yes, a picture of myself that I face up to appear younger. And did they respond to that? Yes, I believe uh, they said, wow, really cute, or something along those lines. Did they also ask whether, through your decoy account, if you were a virgin or not? Yes. And what was your response to that? Yes. And at some point, how long did this messaging go back and forth through the Whisper account? I believe he hit me up the day before the confrontation, and we switched to texting the day that uh, we confronted him. Just to clarify, when you say we, who are you referring to specifically? My production team and someone I was collaborating with there was about nine, ten people. And the purpose of this production team and YouTube is to what? Spread awareness about, uh, you know, the online dangers that children may face. I'm sorry, the online dangers? That children may face using the internet, and also to educate parents. At some point during the whisper conversation, did the person on the other side ask for your number? Yes. And did you provide a number? I did. And did this individual provide a number to you? I believe the individual just texted the number. I remember the message on Whisper saying, can I text you? Did you eventually text this individual? Yes. And did that person respond to your text? Yes. In the response to the text, what did the person say their name was? Fernando. And at some point, was there an arrangement to meet up? Yes. And before you made that arrangement, what were the texts about? About masturbation, asking how, how much I've done, 
Uh, I believe I responded with kissing and him being scared that he's going to get in trouble. And what was the arrangement to meet up? He wanted to come over after he was done with his shift at work, and I told him that I would be home alone, uh, portraying the 13-year-old, of course, and that my mom is at wedding reception, and then uh, we had a couple phone calls and he came over. And was it to the address? Yes, it was. Okay, and is this the person that responded to the address after the text messages? Yes. Just to clarify for the record, just to make sure I understand, you told him you were 15 years old? 13, your honor. Thank you. When the defendant arrived at the location, what happened when he arrived? I greeted him outside the residence and then he followed me inside. Um, He was very nervous. I was very nervous. He asked me why I was shaking, why I was scared. I believe he said I was so young. It was about 14 minutes before we confronted him. So 14 minutes I was portraying a child and eventually he started to get comfortable. And he had an alcoholic beverage with who he thought was a 13 year old and then asked me if I- Objection. Narrative, your honor. Sustained. Next question. Once you were inside of the house with the defendant, what happened? He took a shower and got naked, and before he got naked, he cornered me in the hallway and grabbed my hips. As he thought I was 13 and asked- Objection. Speculation. You can see how Lamgross is trying everything he can to avoid the fact that Fernando thought this girl was 13. That's not speculation. That's f- obvious. Okay, the fact that he cornered her in the hallway and grabbed her remains, the rest is stricken. Thank you. You said he got in the shower. Did he ask you to get in the shower with him? Yes. And what happened when you refused, or if you refused? I said no, then I I was going to walk away, but he wanted me to wait next to the door until he was done with the shower, and he wanted the door open so he could see me. Objection. Speculation. Sustained. So was the door open to the restroom when he was showering? Yes. Did you see him take off his clothing? I did. And you saw him get into the shower? I did, yes. And so he was completely naked in your presence in the shower? Yes. So were you standing in the doorway while he was showering? Yes. And was he speaking to you? I was asking him questions and he would respond, yes, uh, because I could hear my team coming from the area and I didn't want him to hear them coming. So after he was in the shower and your team came in, what happened next? I walked away from the door, uh, got far away, and they took over from there. They walked in and Fernando smiled like a nervous smile and Mr. Kulik of Trilogy Media took his towel when he went to grab his towel um, and they told him to come in the living room and then he started walking to the kitchen and they got him into the living room and sat him down and started asking him what he was doing there. And you were there for this conversation? Yes. Did he say anything in regards to why he was there? He didn't speak much, he just covered his face and cried, so I don't believe we got a pure confession or anything. No further questions, Your Honor. Now it's time for cross-examination, where Michael Lambros does everything he can to try to delegitimize the crimes and, in my opinion, misdirect the entire narrative onto details that don't matter, like Courtney's real age, her tattoos. Take a listen. Thank you, Your Honor. So, Miss Elizabeth, how old are you? Twenty-five. And I see you have some tattoos. You even have your chest tattooed, and you have your right arm tattooed as well, right? Yep, many tattoos. I was doing a cross-examination. So it was the DA, um, you know, speaking to me, asking me questions, and then Michael Lambros would challenge me. And just to be clear, you're not a police officer, right? Objection. Relevance, Your Honor. Overruled. You're not a police officer, correct? Correct. And when you did this little vigilante sting operation, you were working- Objection. Argumentative, Your Honor. Rephrase. So just to clarify, the point of this video that you and your production team were making were to try to catch people that you thought were child predators, correct? Yes. So would it be fair to characterize that as a sting operation? Yes. Objection. Relevance, Your Honor. Overruled. And you're not a police officer, correct? Correct. So it'd be fair to characterize this as a vigilante sting operation. Objection, Your Honor. It doesn't matter how you characterize it. It's irrelevant. You don't have to answer. The answer is stricken. Lambros was cut off, thankfully, from using a term that he loves, vigilante. Again, I'm not a lawyer, so I have no grounds to provide any kind of legal or professional assessment here. I will remind you that this entire video is opinion-based. But my interpretation of vigilanteism involves undertaking law enforcement authority without the authorization to do so. Meaning, committing crimes, facilitating revenge or punishment that you feel is deserved despite it being illegal. Like Batman. But this is fundamentally backwards. We want nothing more than to bring these creeps 
to legitimate law enforcement proceedings and prosecutions. We're not hog tying these guys up in a basement and whipping them with car antennas. Imagine you're at Disneyland and you see a big pile of shit on the ground or a big pile of trash. Now Disneyland has janitors, right? But perhaps this pile of shit is in a location that might be hard to spot. Now a vigilante would hunt down the litterer, stick all the trash in a sandpaper condom and shove it briskly up their ass. Deserved? Arguably, synonymous to what we're doing? Not even f close. What we're doing is the equivalent of picking up the trash, throwing it away, and then reporting the trash and the unmonitored area to an authority and or custodial professional. We're simply here as the conduit to connect a creep in hiding to the viewing world, and hopefully, ultimately, law enforcement. Which, with our track record, is doing just fine. Can you not see the difference, Mr. Lamb Gross? This mother truly is practicing law. You didn't have any support from LAPD when you were doing the sting operation, did you? That current one, no. And they didn't give you any guidance on how to conduct a proper sting operation insofar as how to maintain any evidence, correct? Objection. Relevance, Your Honor. I can get to the relevance, Your Honor. Okay, let's get to the- Okay, so- I can answer that too, Your Honor. Okay, I'll let him ask the questions and you answer them, okay? So you're a content creator, correct? Yes. That means you make videos and content for social media like YouTube, correct? Yes. And that's how you make money, correct? Yep. So your revenue's connected directly to how many likes and views you get, correct? Objection. Relevance. Overruled. I think it's relevant. So your revenue goes directly towards how much likes and views your content makes or receives, correct? Incorrect. I'm demonetized on YouTube. I make zero dollars from YouTube. Now, I've watched a YouTube video that you made about this incident. It's called Naked Man Confronted in the Shower. Parentheses, trying to meet 13-year-old girl. Naked is spelt N and then the at sign. K-E-D, or K-3-D. That YouTube video is demonetized? 100%, yeah. But there's sponsors that did embedded ads on that video, correct? There is, yeah. So let's talk about your code. At one point, when my client's sitting naked on the couch and you're ridiculing him about his body, you tell him to sign up for a fit- Objection. Hold on, please. To sign up for a fit team using your promo code, correct? Yes. So the more ads on this video, it'd be fair to say the better chance you have at people using your ad or your code. Yeah, I'm an influencer. That's what we do. I know. How dare Courtney have sponsors to support all her free content that people get to watch? Her demonetized content at that. She must be utterly immoral to have a sponsor. Lambros, I know having collaborative support from trusted peers and partners is a completely foreign concept to you, but the rest of the world isn't as professionally lonely. And with that being said, before we go any further, I'd love to shout out the sponsor of this video, Guardio. To make this content as much as we'd love for expenses to not be a factor, they are. These things are expensive to make, and even more so now thanks to Lambros. As I've griped about many times in the past, every single one of our predator catches on YouTube have been completely demonetized. Catching child predators is somehow still controversial to some people, which is something I'll never understand. But what's not controversial is not only Guardio's unwavering support of our content and our mission, but the strength importance, and efficacy of their state-of-the-art product. Guardio is an all-in-one tool for complete online safety for you and your whole family. One single subscription covers up to five separate family members simultaneously and will instantly arm you with the best identity theft monitoring, virus and scam protection, and real-time browsing protection that you can possibly find. Their app and browser extension protects you in real time from phishing, tech support fraud, scams, identity theft, and so much more. Guardio checks every site you're about to visit and warns you if it's a threat to your computer or security. It monitors the dark web and notifies you instantly of any data leaks that require your attention. And it'll even filter spam emails and texts that bypass your spam folder keeping your online life safe at every single angle. And their brand new patented social media hijacking protection keeps your social media accounts from being hacked. It happens all the time. Anytime you're logged into an online account, there's a risk that a hacker can steal the information they need to take over the account without needing your username and password. You know how on your computer or your phone you'll sometimes stay logged into certain things for sometimes weeks at a time? Think about it. Do you physically sign into your Instagram account every single time you open it? 
Probably not. The reason you're able to stay logged in is because of a small piece of code that acts as a shortcut to your account. It's pretty well hidden, but not well enough. And Guardio's patented technology removes the need for that code, meaning that even if a hacker does get their hands on it, it's worthless to them. Every single feature I've mentioned, plus many more, come with your Guardio subscription. And if you use our direct link, which is guard.io slash trilogy, you get a big discount off the subscription price, and you can try it seven days completely risk-free. The link is guard.io slash trilogy. You can type it into your browser, or there's a link in the description and the pinned comment below. Give it a try for free, and do your free browser scan right now. Guardio will tell you in seconds if there's any malicious threats currently sitting in your browser or if any of your personal information has been leaked recently with instructions on what to do about it. Go to guard.io slash trilogy. You'll keep yourself five steps ahead of hackers and scammers. And by using that link, you'll be giving a little extra f you to Michael Lambros from Trilogy Media. And this video has 1.4 million views, correct? The video with my client in it? It's on three separate channels. I think mine has maybe 200,000. In the beginning of this video on YouTube, it says that on Trilogy Media, behind a paywall, you can watch the uncensored video. The unblurred out video of my client, is that correct? Not unblurred, it's just less censored. So when this video starts- You would have to ask Trilogy Media- Hold on. Hold on, ma'am. Let him finish his question, and if it's appropriate, you will have the opportunity to respond to Mr. Lambros. The judge and Michael Lambros decided that I was Trilogy Media. That did cause problems for my answers. I could not answer questions um, about certain questions about Trilogy Plus. And you know, I would state, well, I can't answer that. I am not Trilogy Media. And uh, you know, they, they said I was lying. When this video starts and it says that it's unblurred, are you saying that's inaccurate? That the video is in fact blurred? I am not Trilogy Media, I am Courtney Elizabeth. Okay, but you worked with Trilogy Media to make this video, correct? For YouTube, I am not Trilogy Media. That's Trilogy Plus, their streaming service. Okay, so it's your understanding that this video is, in multiple cases, behind a paywall. Is that correct? Yes, and for free entertainment. Okay, here Lambros is making a last ditch effort by continually bringing up all the ways in which Courtney makes or could make money from these stings. Do you know why he's doing that? He's trying to prove unethical bias. He wants to create a narrative that Courtney has a vested interest in misrepresenting the facts of the sting in order to get clicks. He's essentially trying to make it look as though the presence of a profit automatically indicates a lack of integrity with journalistic reporting. Put in simpler terms, Michael Lambros is saying that our approach to these stings is, let's take an innocent man, make him look really guilty so that we can get clicks and make money. Mind blowing. Hey, Lamb Gross, you ever read the LA Times or watch the fing news? It's littered with ads. But unlike you, the vast majority of the world doesn't have sleazy as their default setting. Your position is a reach, but I can see why the mind of a professional scumbag would go there immediately. My question was just a yes or no question. So, in order to get more money, it would be intelligent to. Let me rephrase that. So when it's behind a paywall, views are almost directly translated into money, correct? Objection, Your Honor. Calls for speculation. Sustained. So how would you view a video behind a paywall? Would you have to actually pay and sign up and register an account? Objection. Relevance, Your Honor. Sustained. Again, paywall, paywall, paywall. Who gives a shit what kind of wall it's behind? Truth is truth, regardless of any required prerequisites for a viewing audience. Maybe it is behind a paywall. Maybe it's behind a three inch or more dick wall, which would make the perfect explanation of why Lambros hasn't watched it, and I know he hasn't watched it. You know why? Because multiple times throughout this case, he loves to bring up the idea of revenge porn. You see, in the beginning of every single one of our Predator Sting videos, we have a few disclaimers that pop up on the screen. It's the exact same with every Predator catching video. It's not exclusive to Dickless Fernando. It warns about the sensitive topics about to be discussed and or implied. It protects us from defamation by making it clear that this is only for documentary purposes and everyone is presumed innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. Super ironic, considering the end of this story. You'll see why soon. And it says that any blurring or censoring of alleged perpetrators included in this video are done to abide by privacy guidelines put in place by the YouTube platform. All unblurred and extended versions can be found at TrilogyPlus.com. Now, on the very, very tippy-top surface level of this statement, I can see why Michael Lambros would immediately make the assumption that we've got Fernando's sausage and jingle balls fully on display for a paying subscriber audience. But 30 seconds of research Michael Lambros would have taught you that un 
blurred refers to faces, not cock. With YouTube's community guidelines, we are constantly being hit with bogus privacy complaints and demonetization when we're exposing shitty humans. Gotta protect them scammers. And when we get these privacy complaints from YouTube, even if they're not legally enforceable, we still have to comply, otherwise we get very damaging strikes to our channel. So sometimes we have to use YouTube's blurring tool, which allows for the addition of face blurs after videos have already been published. And in these cases, when we obviously feel that obscuring a criminal's face is nonsense, we're happy to include the unblurred version on Trilogy Plus. Never once have we stated that you can view Fernando's cocklet behind a paywall. Never once have we shared that footage anywhere at all. Of course, the blurring is much heavier on YouTube, but that's to protect the channel from community guidelines, not to protect Fernando. His cock was never exposed, and the claim of revenge porn is absolutely ludicrous. But Lambros never mentioned all of that. Isn't this quack supposed to be smarter than me? May I explain how this is relevant, Your Honor? This is not relevant. So if I may explain, Your Honor, this goes to bias. She has a financial interest. I understand that that's been where it's going, okay? Go ahead. The witness lives out of state, Your Honor. I'm concerned that this witness may not be here for jury trial. So I want to make sure that all of the bias is spelled out in this prelim transcript should the people proceed. I'm not sure. That's the purpose of a preliminary hearing, but I'll let you go down this line of questioning a little bit more. But I understand the gist of what you're saying in terms of profiting from these circumstances. Then I'll move on, Your Honor. So you said when my client was in the shower, he reached for a towel, correct? Yeah. And is that a yes? Yes. And one of the people you were working with, an Art Kulik, took the towel away from him, correct? Yes. And my client also reached for a shirt, correct? I'm not sure. Well, do you remember saying on the YouTube video that you saw Art Kulik reach for a shirt, take the shirt away from my client, and then you praised Art Kulik for taking away my client's clothing? Objection. Relevance, Your Honor. Is there relevance? Your Honor, after this incident, my client tries to leave. They take his clothing, they take his wallet, and they take his cell phone. And they don't let him leave. This is petty theft. Potentially a kidnapping, most definitely a wrongful imprisonment. These are all acts of moral turpitude under Wheeler, and therefore right for impeachment. Mr. Bradford? Can I say something, Your Honor? No, not yet. Mr. Bradford? Your Honor, he went there to meet a 13-year-old girl, voluntarily took a shower. I know, but how do you respond to these other individuals who are there, who take his cell phone, take his wallet, and keep him there naked, basically, in a room. Yeah, well, the witness didn't do that. There were other individuals that were there, so... They're acting together, though, is my understanding. It's a we situation with the production company. She has multiple times referred to the group as we. Okay. May she be allowed to answer the question, Your Honor? Repeat the question one more time. You praised Mr. Art Kulik for taking away my client's clothing, correct? Not that I can recollect. You don't recollect saying that it was cool for him to do that? No. Do you remember your... You and your co-workers, your other influencers, taking away my client's cell phone? I did not take anything away. Well, my question was, you and your fellow influencers, do you remember them taking his cell phone away? I remember them, but I did not. Do you remember them taking his wallet? They left his wallet on the bathroom counter the entire time until the police got there. So they never went through his wallet? They did. They did not take I'm it. I'm not done asking my question, okay? Okay. Once again, Lambros can't seem to comprehend the fact that a collaboration between business entities doesn't automatically mean that we all function together like Siamese twins. We love working together, but we're separate companies with separate content calendars and separate approaches to filming. Which deeply begs the question, Lambros, if you were so concerned with Trilogy Media's approach to this sting operation, then why the f didn't you subpoena us? We had never even heard of your ass until Courtney told us what a f tool you are. But I'm pretty sure I know the answer. Lambros won't subpoena a witness unless he thinks it will help his case. So why would you call to the stand any of the many local representatives of this sting operation, i.e. Trilogy Media, ones that have strong lawyers of our own, ones who are much taller than you? Because that kind of power in numbers is probably a bit intimidating for you, and certainly not conducive to the narrative you're trying to create. Instead, he picks on the ones that he thinks he can bully, the ones that he can inconvenience the most, the ones who live across the country, and the ones that have the largest expense expense at stake. Yeah. Sounds about right. Well, unfortunately, Lamb Gross, you overlooked two things. First, Courtney and Chris are badasses and they're not gonna be pushed around. Second, we all stick together as family, which is the whole reason we got involved in the first place. They never took his wallet and found a picture of his family in his wallet. Objection. Relevance. Calls for speculation. They did not take his wallet. It was on the bathroom counter the entire time, I believe. And the entire time that he was sitting on the couch, the only thing that you and your colleagues gave him was a solo cup to cover his genitals, correct? My colleagues, not me. 
I didn't do that. Well, you often commented on him sitting there in nothing but a solo cup and how pathetic he looked. Because he was, and he got naked in a miner's house? That is pathetic, so yes. You're a miner, ma'am? Thank God, right? Thank God it was an adult. Objection. Argumentative. Let's not- I'm not sure which is argumentative, but I understand your emotional. I understand your- your thoughts on this subject matter. But I need to know what happened. So let's continue on that path. Mr. Lambros. Of course, Your Honor. Next question. So Mr. Artiaga asked to not speak with you guys, correct? Yeah. And you and your colleagues, for lack of a better term, said that if you if you did not if he did not talk to you, you would call the police on him, correct? I don't recollect. And you and your colleagues refused to give him back his belongings, correct? I did not refuse. My colleagues, I don't I don't know, it was nine months ago. Who refused his belongings? He didn't ask! He couldn't put two coherent words together in between all the bitch weeping. All he said was, I don't want to talk. Fine! Well, we do want to talk. And if you're not going to respond, we're just going to fill the silence. Did it hurt your feelings, Fernando? Cry me a f***ing river. You remember that you were waiting 14 minutes with him in the shower before your colleagues gave in? I do. But you don't remember whether or not they would give him back his own personal property. Objection. Asked and answered. At this point, I think it's covered. No further questions, Your Honor. It physically hurts my brain to debunk something, yet continually hear it spoken as think fact by a mindless ignoramus. We robbed him of his clothes, his wallet, and his phone. We kidnapped him. We wrongfully imprisoned him. This is absolutely unfounded, categorically false f***ing nonsense. We keep his hands off his clothes to protect us, in case he has a weapon, which he f***ing did! We didn't take and hide his clothes, we threw it on the f***ing floor. The wallet, knife, and cell phone stayed at the f***ing crime scene, and we let him cover his genitals because we're just that sweet. All while this f was trying to shower and have sex with a child. Get f***ing real. Michael Lambros, uh, you know, his closing words were um, that Art and I kidnapped Fernando. Um, it was mainly just Art and I he kept bringing up. We kidnapped Fernando. You kidnapped him, you robbed him. Yep. He was mainly stuck on Art of Trilogy. I was confused as to why I was answering questions on Art's behalf. If he wanted Art there to question Art, he should have subpoenaed Art or at least somebody from Trilogy Media. And he was, um, you know, saying that we kidnapped him, we robbed him, and that we have revenge porn on him. All of this is false. Redirect. Briefly, were the police called to the location? Yes. And how long after he got out of the shower were the police called? Immediately. And so did you and your colleagues keep him there for the police to arrive? I believe we stated that he was free to go. We can't hold people. And how long after they were called did they arrive to the location? A while, I'm not sure, maybe, my guess would be over 20 minutes. We did the non-emergency. Okay, and Council made a big deal about you being an influencer and working on YouTube channels and things of that nature. Uh, in this case, who owns, I guess, the video or the rights to the video? I do. Skeeter Jean and Trilogy Media. Okay, so for your purposes, have you used it to monetize yourself in any way? I did post it on Locals, but it is free on YouTube, so Locals is like Patreon. Have you received money for this video? Yes. And is it a substantial portion of your income? Uh, probably received about $40, so no. It's not, uh, it's not my income, or a large amount of my income. No further questions, Your Honor. Thank you. Anything else? Just briefly, yes. So this video you made $40 on, correct? Approximately. But this video is a, it's a part of a larger library of videos where you and your colleagues will set up these kind of stings, correct? Objection. Relevance, Your Honor. Sustained. Again, trying to attribute the content or the larger library of videos as some sort of tell that we automatically throw integrity out the window and misrepresent people's crimes for the sake of clicks. Your Honor. At this point. So it would be like saying, like, we can't compartmentalize it. This is part of a larger library, right? If this is just one video in a larger library, we can't say- Again, the question for me now is her credibility, not whether she and her colleagues are committing any offenses or violating any laws by doing what they're doing. I understand your question, and she answered it. She is profiting from it. So, I think the point is made. I mean, I don't think it's going to help your case or hurt your case, no matter what the answer is. So if you want to go ahead with that single question, that's fine, but I understand the point you're trying to make. I'm not sure it gets us any further in terms of the prelim in this case. Understood, Your Honor, then I'll move on. Just real quick, to set up a Whisper account, you have to be over 18, correct? No. Objection. Relevance. You do not. You do not. 
You don't have to click terms of service that verify that you're over 18. Objection, Your Honor. It's a 15 and up app. Actually, fun fact, Whisper is 13 and up. But beyond that, even if it were 18, the issue at hand is not the age restriction of any app's terms of service. I agree that children should not be on these apps, but the sad reality is they are on these apps. Whether the age requirement is 13, 15, or 18, kids find a way. They're not stupid, but they will be preyed upon, and that's the whole reason why we're here. No further questions, Your Honor. Thank you. Any redirect? No, Your Honor. Thank you. May this witness be excused? Yes. Okay, thank you. Ma'am, you're- Yes, Your Honor. I just want to put this on the record. I served her with a subpoena due chase Tecum earlier today to be heard on the 29th in this court when this case would be set for arraignment upstairs. It's to personally appear. She was personally served. To personally appear on, I think, the next court date, if the defendant is held to answer, I think it would be the 28th, unless you're requesting to continue to- I calculated the 29th because the 25th is a holiday. I think it's still the 28th. In that case, Your Honor, if Judge could order her back pursuant to that SDT, otherwise we could trail it one day and not push it to the 29th. I'll be here either way. Your Honor, just so- Why don't we hold off so that we can hear argument from both sides to see if the defendant will be held to answer? And if so, let's take one step at a time. So, ma'am, you are excused, subject to recall, which means- you should wait outside in the hall, but don't leave, okay? But I would like her ordered back for the future. I will only hold him to answer. Are there any other witnesses? No, Your Honor. So, people have rested. The defense has no evidence. Does this defense have argument? Motion to dismiss. Insufficiency of the evidence, Your Honor. Motion to dismiss respectfully. Denied. The defendant is held to answer on the charge. I thought the area lines of questioning were proper in terms of credibility and any benefit, monetary benefit, she would gain from this. And I thought the questions regarding whether there was any police training were appropriate as well. In any event, the defendant is held to answer. He will remain on his own recognizance. The next court date is December the 28th in Department 133. There was another gentleman who was a part of this production company who's in the hallway that I served with a subpoena due chase TCOM as well. If we could have- Yes. Just so judge is aware, both witnesses are from Wisconsin, and so- Okay. Is there any reason that they physically need to be here? Yes. And that was my question. To ask if there was a way to have them provide the evidence through the detective and provide it to counsel. No. It's a huge inconvenience. It's an arraignment and plea date. It's not a date to take testimony. And so- It's a date for an SDT, Your Honor. I've personally served them with the SDT. I believe that these people have a financial motivation in making this case look one way. I've subpoenaed their, not only their communications, but the production notes, the uncut footage, their text messages, and any other financial information. As the prosecution pointed out, they do live in Wisconsin. If I do not maintain jurisdiction on them by personally serving them here in California, I may lose them forever. So I have to do it this way. I understand it's an inconvenience, but that's the way it is. Well, Your Honor, again, just like all the other evidence that's been provided, it always goes through the detective. Who can provide it to him? She testified it's not her production company. She also- Trilogy Media. She has her own, I guess, own separate production company. And so I don't know how she could be held responsible for Trilogy Media's information. She also testified that it's on her YouTube channel as well. This was a production that she was a part of. Production that she helped in concert. If there is well, going she's... to be a motion to quash- One at a time. One at a time. If there's going to be a motion to quash, we can hear that on the date. And she can have her lawyer come argue that motion to quash, not the people. The people have no standing to argue that motion. This is one of the problems in what happened here. Instead of allowing the police to do their job, to take it into one's hands, it, it's surprising. In fact, actually, in the beginning, I thought she was the what we call the complaining witness or the victim. Right. I was a little bit surprised by the testimony I heard. There's something about this matter that just... It does, it, it concerns me. Understood. And your honor, just- I think that's fair, you know, just, but my job is limited in terms of whether or not there is enough evidence to hold him to answer. Frankly, I'd rather have the police do this work than civilians. With regard to the subpoena, I am going to order them both to come. I mean, it's, you know, they chose to go into this. They have to deal with what responsibilities come with that. So why don't we have them come in? Officer, if you wouldn't mind, I know I said so, but just for clarity, I am holding the defendant to answer. Next court date, Department 133, the December 28th date is the next date. Okay, so that's on the 15th floor, right? Yes, 15th floor. Okay, we have Courtney and the gentleman next to you. Who are you, sir? Christopher. All right, I understand. You were both served with subpoenas today to appear in L.A. County Superior Court in Department 133. I believe the date on the subpoena is 
the 29th. That's correct, Your Honor. It should be the 28th. You're both ordered to appear on that date with, I mean, you decide how you're going to appear, but you're both ordered to appear on that date. Right away, he handed us subpoenas to come back in two weeks. Michael Ambrose walked away after giving us those. The detective told us, uh, don't worry, I'm sure you won't actually need to come. This might get finished up today. Not only did Michael Ambrose hand us uh, subpoenas unofficially, um, but he gave Chris a subpoena for Chester, which is Skeeter Jean's security. So it was the wrong date, it was the wrong name. Very unorganized. Yes. So now with another court-ordered subpoena for Courtney and Chris to return to court, two weeks later, across the country, Michael Lambros wastes no time in seizing this opportunity to burden, bully, and intimidate Chris and Courtney as much as he possibly can. We at Trilogy Media were right down the street, but as I suspected from the beginning, he wants nothing to do with us. After she came out of the courtroom, uh, the detective, the DA said, yeah, you guys are gonna have to come back on the 28th. It's actually the 29th though, but the subpoena, Mr. Lambros gave me said the 28th. So I said, oh, can you change this to the 29th? Cause I gotta get the days off of my, my work. And they said, oh, um, th they'll have to do that in the courtroom. Uh, we can't do that cause we're not the ones subpoenaing you. Um, they said, Mr. Lambros will have to do it. So we go into the courtroom. I'll go to Mr. Lambros and I say, hey, hey can you change? I, I need a new subpoena. I needed to say the right date. And he said, yeah, I suppose I could do that. And I said, yeah, cause I need to get the right days off of work. And that just snapped something in his head. He was like, mm, it's not my problem. And he gave it back to me and uh, left. And so I explained to the judge, I need a new subpoena so that it has the right days, so I get the right days off work. And the judge says, well, this isn't my case anymore. It's not my jurisdiction. So then the court reporter uh, said, I might be able to print you something that, that shows that the date was changed. I'm like, okay, thank you. Mr. Lambros comes back in and the court reporter asks him, can you please just sign on his subpoena, the new date? And he says, all right, I guess I could do that. He takes it out of my hands and says, it's just one day, not that different. And I said, well, it does matter because I got to get the right days off work. And again, it snapped in his head. He's like, that's not my problem and gave it back to me. And that's when hell kind of broke loose. Me and Courtney start walking out with him and I'm like, sir, I need you to change this. I, I need the days off work. You know, you're dragging me out here. We even stated we don't care, but his, you know, day job that he works at uh, cares. Mm -hmm. It's pretty important. And he says, um, what you guys did to this man's life, referring to Fernando, referring to us catching Fernando in the act of trying to meet up with a 13 year old girl. Yes. What you guys did to this man's life, you've ruined his life. And we in unison said what Fernando was trying to do to this 13 year old girl's life. And Lambro said, oh, I don't want to hear that bullshit kind of yes. thing. Yes, that was the very first time that he said a swear word. So I'm asking the detective, I'm like, this is crazy. And the yes. detective even says, like, I've never seen a lawyer act this way. And this is an ICAC detective yes. who's met many lawyers representing sex offenders, child molesters, and he said he's never seen a lawyer act like this. So Lambros, representing somebody who's been caught trying to meet a 13-year-old girl, feels in his heart he needs to go above and beyond to protect this man. The detective then gives us the idea you know, let's go up to the public defender's office and ask them how it works. You know, uh, getting the trip paid for was the next big concern. We, this was all paid for yeah. to get here the first time. Didn't expect to come back uh, exactly two weeks later. And I thought, okay, well, it'll get paid for again, easy. And the DA and the detective were like, well, no, since we're not the ones subpoenaing you, it's actually Lambros that would have to pay for that trip. And the detective said, let's just go up to their office, maybe talk to the front desk, his supervisor, and get it straightened out. Didn't go so well. Uh, we were waiting there for about an hour, an hour and a half, I would say. Mind you, we've been there all day, just flew across the US. Um, and so we were being very patient. He came in, he got into an argument with the ICAC detective. We went to the desk in the in the lobby. Yeah. And we said, hey, you know, we have uh, this issue. We apparently have to come back in two weeks. Is it gonna be paid for? Does your office pay for it? And the lady at the desk was like, oh, well, that'll have to be up to the uh, the attorney that's subpoenaing you. And I think in most cases, they subpoena people to help their case. Yes. So they're like, yeah, I'll pay for this trip because you're going to come here and your testimony is going to help my case. But he made it clear that's not what it's about. He wants to inconvenience us. Yes, uh, I will say that he was laughing and talking about uh, burdening you know, the people that live furthest away 
um, as, as long as he can, and he was laughing, uh, and he was talking to um, someone else in the courtroom, I don't know who, but... His colleagues or yeah. something. He also told Courtney, I'm gonna make Fernando your problem for life, lady. Yeah. We just had a simple question, you know, how are you funding this? You want it to help your case, right? You want us to help your case, right? No. Um, and uh, he said, that's not my problem. You wanted to play cop. This is what you get. We're like, no, no, seriously. Like, we need correct dates on this subpoena and uh, we need to get this funded. And he's like, that's not my problem, lady. Then the ICAC detective stepped in um, and was kind of defending us and being like, no, dude, seriously. And then he's like, no, seriously, if you don't leave my office right now, if you don't leave my lobby right now, I will have you, you guys escorted out of here. And it was just so crazy, that behavior, because we were just waiting for a simple question um, to be answered. And he said, uh, Michael Lambros did state that if uh, we do not show up in two weeks, that he will have Los Angeles police uh, come or contact Madison, Wisconsin police and get us flown back out here and arrested. So now it's two weeks later. And after being told at the last hearing by Mr. Lambros that Courtney and Chris's travel expenses are, quote, not his problem, Courtney and Chris were financially unable to make that second trip happen with such short notice. From December 14th to December 28th, we filed complaints with his supervisor. We filed complaints with the California Bar Association. We did everything we could to expose Michael Ambrose for the way he treated us. We're witnesses. We're just witnesses. Yes. This isn't our case. No, um, it's it's not it's not Mr. Artiaga, you know, versus us. Uh, it's it's the people versus Mr. Artiaga, which is Fernando. So the 28th is approaching. We can't afford the trip. It's it's just not going to happen. And you know, in those in those emails that we sent out, you know, not only um, reporting him to the bar and stuff, we did try so hard. We're like, listen, we are more than compliant to show up. We just need at least two more weeks. You know, like we were not expecting this so soon again. Uh, it's taking time away from my me catching. Um, you know, and that you know helps fund things. Uh, and uh, yeah, it was just not happening. We're like, if we're we're gonna come, just can we can you work with us a little bit? Nobody was willing to work with us. And of course, Lamb Gross tries to paint the picture to the judge that Chris and Courtney are willingly disobeying court orders. But thankfully, the DA that day graciously called Chris and Courtney to get them into the hearing telephonically and vouch for them to the judge that their absence was strictly due to financial reasons. When the actual court date came, we found out later it's their responsibility to make that known to the court that we are attempting to come, yeah. but that, you know, the reason why we can't make it. But instead, on the 28th or 29th, when we weren't there, he told the judge that we were not compliant, that we were uh, disruptive in the hallway when we were there, we were acting like children, those kind of things he said to the judge. And the judge, I think, was ready to issue a warrant. Yes. But the DA that day was nice enough to call us and we answered, we were home. Yep. And she explained the situation to us, we explained the situation to her, it was news to her. And that's how we know that, um, you know, Michael Lambros was saying these lies and out outrageous, you know, allegations against us in the hallway. That's how we knew, because um, uh, the DA did call me. Michael Lambros was not expecting that. I was able to clear the air and tell my side. And the DA was like, wow, the judge does not know this. This is not the story that we got. They are obviously not before the court. I indicated that the court, obviously they failed to comply with the subpoenas and failed to appear with issue a body attachment, meaning that the bench warrant and then normally the court holds those. Okay, so you're gonna hear the term body attachment used a lot here. It's very similar to a bench warrant or an arrest warrant. Lambros, of course, immediately puts body attachments on Courtney and Chris, which means they are lawfully obligated to show up to court on the day. And if they don't, they will be arrested and charged. So they call it a body attachment, meaning that our bodies need to be brought there to Los Angeles. But the judge gave us the deal that if we show up to the next court date, that we will not, that those warrants will be held until then. The warrants will not be issued, so we will not be arrested. Yes. Take notice now in this upcoming hearing. The new judge on the case wants to hold the body attachment, which means she wants to give Chris and Courtney another chance to show up to court at a later date. Lambros, on the other hand, wants the court to release the body attachment, meaning he wants Courtney and Chris arrested and charged now 
for not showing up that day. And listen to how Lambros justifies this by revisiting his weeping session of criminal accusations against Courtney and Chris. Only to be reminded by the judge that this case isn't against Courtney and Chris, it's against Fernando. My understanding is counsel for Mr. Artiega is strongly objecting to the court holding the bench warrant and is asking that the body attachment be released for non-compliance, for failure to appear in court, and for failure to produce the subpoenaed documents. Counsel, is that an accurate representation? That's correct, Your Honor. With one clarification, Judge Wilson ordered them to come here. Judge Hereford signed the Certificate of Materiality, which would mandate their appearance despite the fact they live 150 miles away. Thank you, I stand corrected. It was Judge Wilson and not Hereford. Counsel, I know that you would like to make a record as it relates to the body attachment or lack of compliance with the subpoena, as well as their failure to appear. You may do so now. That's correct, Your Honor. One of the fundamental rights that my client has is to compel not only testimony, but also compel witnesses to bring in subpoena documents. We've properly served them with a subpoena, and we had Judge Wilson order them back to personally appear. They're not here. We need this information, and we need to maintain jurisdiction over both witnesses. There's two issues here. Not only do I need the material they have, but I also need to maintain jurisdiction over these two individuals. The prosecution can later say that they're unavailable for being outside the jurisdiction of California. I maintain jurisdiction over them right now. This is a case where my client was subject to, quite frankly, a vigilante sting operation. The YouTube footage is in the court file. It was marked as an exhibit and admitted into evidence. During that vigilante sting operation, for lack of a better phrase, they film my client naked. They notify the viewer on YouTube that you could pay to see the uncensored, unblurred version, as long as you pay enough to get behind the paywall. They take his wallet, they take his cell phone, and as he's getting dressed, they strip him of his clothes and take his top. They film him naked and ridicule him for about 40 minutes. The credibility is at issue for two parts. One, how much money did they make at this? They have a motivation to make it look like it was something that it wasn't. And two, that is quite frankly, a kidnapping, a false imprisonment, a robbery, and very clearly revenge porn. I need these witnesses here. I need to maintain jurisdiction over them, and I need the material that they have. First, so that basically I know that we have both witnesses basically here telephonically. And if I could just have you state your name, and I believe that's Miss Courtney, are you still there? Courtney. Thank you. And then Mr. Yes, Christopher. Thank you. So I know that you've heard many different potential crimes that the defense is indicating that you've allegedly committed. At this point right now, I just want to make it clear that at this point, neither of these individuals have been charged with any crime by the prosecutor. Is that correct and fair? Yes. I mean, the only one who's charged is obviously the defendant. And this is the defense. What he just said, because I don't want... It sounds like Courtney has already had a bad experience speaking to defense counsel. I don't want her to think that somehow what he's saying is actually true. Neither Courtney nor Christopher are charged with crimes. This is just defense's interpretation of what he believes happened. And in terms of what is in front of us today, it's the defendant's criminal case. So I just want to make it clear to both of the witnesses that are appearing telephonically that both of you were ordered to appear personally in court today. Failure to do so subjects you to a bench warrant, to a body attachment, to arrest. I ask the people, the prosecution, to reach out to you and to communicate with you the court's intention to issue a body attachment. The court may or may not withhold it, I'm inclined to hold it, but I need assurances that you would then be available to come to court on the next date, number one. I will note that any expense incurred for your appearance will be reimbursed. The prosecutor can present basically the amount for the flight and hotel during your stay, as well as food and travel, as long as I receive those assurances. Additionally, I'm not familiar with what was subpoenaed as I don't have the subpoena in front of me, but whatever was requested, that needs to be turned over to both the prosecution and the defense. The reason I'm saying this is because I'm trying to alleviate any sort of issues that may arise if there has been some sort of problems in terms of communication. If she feels more comfortable providing it to the people and to the defense so that there's no misunderstanding as to what was provided, that's her prerogative. The question that I have for both Courtney and Mr. 
is that if I order you to appear on the next court date, which again, I'm inclined to do, and I'm inclined to issue a body attachment and hold it to the next court date, are you going to be cooperative? Yes, you know, we, we were more than happy to come back. We just said that we needed a little bit more time for financial reasons and uh, we were told that is not my problem. So I do apologize for not being there. I We will both of us absolutely be there the next time. We just needed a little more time for financial uh, reasons. Correct, correct. And so again, I, you did appear via subpoena from the people if you submit your documentation to them for the first appearance that you made, which was in December, they can submit a request for a reimbursement for that. And most definitely on the next date that we select whatever expense you incur, as long as you keep the receipts and present that to the people, you can actually coordinate with them. We can handle that. Okay, thank you. When we, you know, asked about it, we weren't really getting anywhere, so we were not aware of that. We communicated with the defense on this, and uh, we're, we're told that it's not his problem. And so normally, um, the court reimburses. The prosecutor, the people are here, they're listening to this. This is all on the record, meaning that the court reporter is taking down everything that is being said here in open court so that you are made aware of the representations made by the court and the district attorney is nodding affirmatively that she will handle that reimbursement aspect so that you are not out monies for your willingness to and frankly your obligation to come to court so i understand you know not having the funds to make it so we will make sure that you are reimbursed for that. So what is a good date? I'm I'm gonna let the people and the defense pick a date and then I'm gonna ask you if that's a good date because I'm gonna basically coordinate with the witnesses since you need them here. So we can pick a date that's suitable for all parties. We asked for January 8th, if that's available for 133. So 133 is not going to be in session for January. And then my my understanding is that the other dates are pretty full. And so they're requesting February, which makes sense because unfortunately we're just, I think that that's probably the best time. And then that will give the witnesses at least a month in which to get here. I'm asking for a sooner date, Your Honor. My client has a statutory right to a speedy trial. He also has a right to subpoena and compel witnesses and investigate. By putting it out to 30 days, you're potentially, those two rights are at odds for each other. This is information that I need as soon as possible. Lambros is trying so hard right now to make the hearing as soon as possible. He knows it's gonna be harder for Courtney and Chris to show up, and if they don't show up, it helps his case dramatically. Another probable testament to why he never reached out to or subpoenaed Art or myself. I could have saved a lot of time editing this video and just told him all this to his face. But alas, here we are. So Mr. and Miss Elizabeth, is it possible for you to provide the subpoenaed documents? And would that be via email to the defense as soon as possible? We, we're we unaware of what documents are needed, but I, I suppose any documents that are needed, we can, we can send yeah. over, yeah. Perfect. So counsel, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this on the record so that it is clear on the subpoena and indicates the following. I'm going to have the defense attorney state what it is. I will also have the defense attorney provide his contact information, phone and email, so that that can be sent. The defense attorney in this case, his name is Michael and last name is Lambros. If you see the second page of a subpoena, there's a paragraph. The second paragraph that's in all capital letters. Do you see that? Yes. Okay, that's the requested information which I'll read into the record. All raw video and audio recordings, phone logs, production notes, text messages, recorded phone calls, emails, and personal notes pertaining to the planning, filming, production, preparation, and distributing and marketing of the YouTube video. Quote, naked man confronted in the shower, parenthetical, trying to meet a 13-year-old girl. And parenthetical. So I'm going to break it down because obviously I want to facilitate the production of this. So all the video that was involved in this, and that is video that's not uploaded to YouTube. So if there was some video, I'm just going to use this as an example of the two of you arriving and setting up the camera. That's the raw video that the defense is requesting. That would 
be uh, Trilogy Media. They would have that footage. So if you could provide via email, if it is Trilogy footage, if you could give that information to the defense so that they can then obviously subpoena them. This is information that you have in your possession. So if Trilogy video has that, then what I'm going to request of you is to get the name, the telephone number, the contact information to provide to defense to respond to raw video request. So Trilogy Media, if they gave you something as it relates to the production that would qualify under production notes, and if you have those in your possession, that would be needed to turn over distribution. So it's my understanding that this was distributed to YouTube and other channels, that agreement, any documentation as it relates to distribution. Additionally, marketing of the YouTube or any other channels, and I think that covers it. And there's one thing I'd like to add that might expedite things. It became relevant after prelim, which is any financial records. That's not in the subpoena. It's not, but... So, no, I'm not ordering that. Okay, then I'll have to re-subpoena at the next court date. That's fine. Okay, that's fine. I just didn't want to keep... If you ask the people, maybe the people can get it from them. I shouldn't have to go through the people. This is a defense investigation. That should be able to be independent from that. Counsel? Your Honor? You're absolutely correct. You should be able to do it independently. I'm not ordering that because it's not subpoenaed. I am trying to facilitate it because you made it very clear to me that you want to do this investigation as soon as possible. I'm just offering a suggestion. If you'd like to take the suggestion, that's perfectly fine. And if not, that's fine too. And all I was suggesting is that if they could produce it at the same time, that would prevent me having to subpoena it putting it over for another date, and having them come back for another court date. So I was just trying to be courteous to their time. And the reason why I was suggesting the people is because they've expressed that there was some conflict with you, and so to use the people as a mediator between you two. That's just merely a suggestion. It's worked in the past. Understood. Lambros was going off about how we kidnapped this man, we robbed this man, he was getting heated. Yet again. And, yep. and the judge was getting upset with him. She was like, counsel? And he said, your honor. Like, I, I wish I could have been there to see that interaction. Um, but the problem is the judge and DA on that day was different than the judge and the DA on the previous day. Yes. And then on the next day in February, on February 1st, a different judge, a different DA. So the only person that's constant through all this is Lambros, me, and Courtney, and of course, Fernando but it's easy for him to treat us the way he is because there's nobody supervising him or supervising the whole situation. Correct. It was insane. I mean, it really became Lambros and Fernando versus Chris and Courtney. Yes. So I think that this has been very productive. Are there any questions that you have so we can clarify that now? No, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. So. At this time, what I'm going to do is a body attachment is going to be issued and held. My judicial assistant is indicating the first available date is February 1st. So in regards to Mr. Artiega, the defendant is arraigned and Mr. Artiega, a not guilty, has been entered on your behalf. The two witnesses that were ordered back, and that would be Courtney as well as Christopher, both are not here and both have not complied with the subpoena. At this time, the court is going to issue a body attachment. However, the court is going to hold the body attachment until the date of February 1st. They are both here telephonically. So I am holding a body attachment until February 1st. If you do not appear or have not complied, then the court could potentially release that, which would subject you to being arrested, incarcerated for your failure to comply. I hope and trust based on your representation that you'll be able to be here again. So long as you communicate with the people, they can help facilitate your appearance. They can present to the court your receipts for your flight, for your housing, for your transportation and food, which you will be reimbursed for. So counsel, I'm going to set this for a pretrial date of February 1st for Mr. Artiega. You are ordered to appear in Department 133 on February 1st, 2024. You are ordered to appear here on that date. And again, a body attachment is issued and held for both of the witnesses. Is there anything further from the people? I did want to add, Your Honor, just in speaking to Courtney just before we got on a record, she mentioned that basically the lack of being here today was due to the fact that it was for financial reasons and 
it seems like there was really a problem with communication with defense counsel because both she and Christopher expressed that it was just hard for them financially to be here on today's date. They had no intention of not complying and in response, as she described, she believed that there was witness intimidation by defense counsel and that he was laughing at them. So I think for those reasons, Your Honor, there was just a breakdown in communication and unfortunately, I, I think if we would have been able to speak to her, things might have been different. Um, do I have that correct, Courtney? Yes. Okay, so for those reasons, they're not here. It's not a willful disobedience to the court as I think it was initially represented. Okay, and so at this point, again, the court is holding it and the defendant remains, I believe that he's on inkle monitoring, yes? Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you. We'll see everybody back here in Department 133 on February 1st. February 1st. It's all about to go down. Now you heard from the last judge that reimbursement of travel expenses is easily achievable. And while reimbursement is helpful, it's not an immediate solution when you don't have the funds to front it. And all this goes down the drain anyway today, February 1st, as we have yet again a new judge and a new DA who is telling Courtney that there would be no reimbursement. But more on that later. Throughout all this, we've seen intimidation. We've seen uh, harassment from him. We've seen threats from him. But now that we know Trilogy Media is going to join us for this date, we didn't know what to expect. We know that Art and Ash aren't going to take it and that maybe he'll just act like he's not that kind of guy. He's going to oh, yes. maybe be we, more quiet. We discussed and... that, you know, um, you know, Chris and I did discuss, uh, well, you know, Trilogy Media is coming on the February 1st court date. How do you think it's going to be? And uh, Chris is like, we were both like, oh, he's probably going to be super professional. And uh, it was definitely the opposite. A couple weeks prior to February 1st, Courtney made this post on her Facebook asking for financial support for her and Chris to travel to California yet again in order to avoid being arrested. Seeing this post was honestly the first time that we at Trilogy Media caught wind of the severity of the situation. We had spoken to Courtney previously before in passing about Lambros and what a cock farmer he is, but we were unaware of the extent of his abuse and threats until we read this post. Courtney is extremely humble and is not the type that will ask for help easily. So we knew that her making this post was indicative of a really serious issue. So we decided to get involved. So not only did it take Art and I about two seconds to decide that we're gonna fund the entire thing, but we're also going to be present at the court on February 1st to be there for moral and physical support for Courtney and Chris, having to face Fernando and effectively Lambros yet again. She made a post on her Facebook page. This is the bus that I've done, Steam House operation that I've done like nine months ago. We need to fly back to Los Angeles. Government, court, whoever is not paying for it, and we basically cannot afford it. I was like, hey, I'll come down there, I'll support you guys, what do you want me to do? If I can film, I'll film. We called Courtney, I was like, Courtney, what's going on? She was like, well, it's been a lot of like bullshit, a lot of stuff happening. You know, and like on a serious note, real quick, I, we really do appreciate that. And with all yeah, the but, court dates I keep telling you guys too, it's like, oh, we did it virtually this time. I just don't wanna ever like have you guys be like, because you guys are so sweet, you guys are like, oh, let me pay for this. No, I don't like that. Mr. Uh, Lemgros, Lembros? AKA Little Chihuahua, who had and still having beef towards Trilogy Media. He been very, very verbally aggressive towards my company, our company. He said that we kidnap or I kidnapped the guy. I didn't give him a, um, a child predator, uh, Fernando. I didn't give him his clothes back. He was naked. Uh, ironic that he was supposed to be underage minor uh, house. He been naked, sh sh showed up with a knife, uh, naked, got busted, but with the bad guys, right? So we said, okay, let's go. 7.30. Oh, still struggling with this. All right, boys and girls, today is a Thursday. We're going to see a public defender with who? With a public figure. Ah, oh, so two publics are gonna meet together and they're gonna have a date, verbal date. I hope we're gonna attend and just see what happens. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, we'll try. Courtney's and Chris are witnesses, so there to support them and support the predator catching community and support our amazing squad who made gave us the ability to do this in the first place. So you guys all deserve an update. So, Thank you so much. we're gonna yes. get as much as we can. We're gonna go as we already know that this public defender, not big uh, fan of mine, he loves Weasel. She loves me oh. so much. Oh, 
This tall guy didn't allow my client to dress up. He just gave him a cup to cover his crotch. The cup was plenty sufficient. And we were up late last night catching more predators, so uh, Lambros will be happy to yes. know that. And uh, we're going to catch some more today and hopefully some scammers too. So. We'll talk to this little Napoleon and I'm going to ask him, well, I heard you've been talking a lot of shit about me and then <laughs> here I am. How much time have I spent driving us in the rain to do some, some yeah. shit? Especially bang, bang wagon, wagons, bang I've wagons. I've driven a lot of vehicles in the rain for us yeah. to do some dumb shit. Yeah, well, I mean, cleaning streets of United States, I don't think yeah, it's a dumb no, shit. You know I mean. Chasing criminals, f child pedophiles. All right, downtown LA, it's right there somewhere in the clouds. Defender is very close, the public defender, we're coming for you. I'm bringing you my fucking public defender. I'm with here. My public finger. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I said public finger. Finger <laughs> Public finger. All right, public middle finger. Let's go get public defender. I got a middle finger. For you it. got a middle finger? Okay, good. Several days prior to the hearing, I submitted the court required MC500 and MC510 forms requesting permission to film and or broadcast the court proceedings. I was ultimately denied this request, but I'm going to get into that in a minute. Let me Oh, shit. Okay. All right. Good job. Hey. All right, we found it. Um, I texted Courtney. Let's see where she's at first. All right, so we parked in the archives building. LA County Archives. Oh, ho, ho, ho. Oh, ho, ho, ho. Now you're that guy. <laughs> Just to reflect what he was saying. Reflect me? <laughs> <laughs> Defend me? Why every single time we have sting house predator operations? It's it pouring, it pours. It rains. Uh -huh. But you know what? This uh. rain is fake. Oh, you fake it's rain. All, it's fake. all Hollywood right Cop now. Cars are fake. Yeah, cops Police are officers fake. Police officers are fake. Reds are fake. Predators are fake. Rain is fake. Your dick is fake. <laughs> <laughs> You stupid motherfucker! That was the last time! And then time you put me in the- F*** you! F***ing spray me, bitch! You f***ing asshole! You just spit all over me! <laughs> Dick! <laughs> this is comedy gold! Come on. Dude, we should be here more often yeah, you know, and make that's videos. What I said. If you wanna do Comedy Central? Guys, if you want more downtown LA content, just let us know. Take your sparkling f***ing penis water and spit it all over my face on, on a Thursday morning. <laughs> I in the morning As if I wasn't down. wet enough. <laughs> you look f***ing yeah. ridiculous. What, Mr. Spitovich? Go to the next cover. There we go. Uh, no, that's fine. I'm just kidding. It's gonna happen. All right, well, let's go to the yeah. Oh my god, you look so stupid. I'd rather be wet than look like that. Which one is it? I thought you knew. I don't think it can't go in there. I don't think it's this building. I think it's that building. <laughs> oh man. Oh man. Oh. Oh, it's cold too. <laughs> Stupid. <laughs> you look so you like me, Jay. <laughs> Oh shit. All right, wait here. It's February 1st, and here's where I got into trouble. Before the trial even started, I took video recording with my phone in the hallway of the courthouse. Not in the courtroom, in the hallway. I took this recording because I saw Lambros approaching. And in order to protect ourselves and Courtney, from verbal abuse, physical abuse, and or possible future defamation claims, I felt it extremely necessary to capture on film what felt like was about to be a very heated exchange. And it was. We get there on time, and we're there in the hallway outside the courtroom. Landbro shows up 15, 20 minutes after court. Public Defender showed up. I'm glad that trilogy got to experience it in person, because it was absolutely insane. And he walked towards us, and Courtney, she was like, that's the guy, that's the one who's been talking shit all this time. So he started approaching to the door towards the uh, towards his court, and he kind of looked at us, he put his uh, head down, and he walked straight to the door. As he's walking to the courtroom, we all greet him. And all I said, with a big smile, good morning, Mr. Public Defender. 
he looks over and he sees Art and Ash and he knows who they are. So he comes over and, oh and says, hey, I was gonna subpoena you guys. It was this video recording that I took, along with one other video that I took after the hearing of another confrontation with Lambros that almost got me thrown in jail. I was court ordered to delete the videos under threat of arrest and being charged with contempt of court. Allow me to explain. First, please witness this reenactment of our first heated exchange with Michael Lambros. This reenactment is a verbatim recreation from the recollection of all witnesses present, which includes myself, Art, Connor, Courtney, and Chris. It wasn't long, but it was powerful. Good morning, public defender. Oh. Hey. Good morning. How you guys doing? We're fantastic. How are you? I was actually gonna subpoena all you guys. Why didn't you? I didn't need to. Oh, well, lucky day, huh? I'm surprised you guys aren't here with your cameras. Well, yeah, we're just here to support. We okay? We confident without cameras. You filed a motion, right? We sure did, yeah. The judge said they decide on the day. Well, you guys didn't serve it on me now, did you? Well, it's not what the court requires. It requires that I submit it through media requests. Oh, you're a lawyer. You're a lawyer. Well, no, but I read the law and I read the court requirements. And I thought you had a lot of nice things to say about me. So I'm here for you. This is hilarious. My ears all for you because I know you love me so much. Hey, look, anytime somebody who robs somebody kidnaps him, I'm always appreciative. Who told you that? I watched the video. Oh, you did. Did we watch the same video? The one that you posted on YouTube? Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. And how many times we said you're free to leave? Who held a gun to his head to keep him there? Oh, I didn't know that was an element of kidnapping, is it? Well, how do you define kidnapping? Oh, shit. With the law. Forcible restraint? No, it's not. Force and fear. Dumbass. Dumbass, coming from a public defender. This is amazing. I told you, I can't make that up. You can't make this shit up. Oh, did you file a motion? Mm, you didn't put that through me, did you? And Ash explained, well, I didn't have to. I followed the law, I followed the rules. Yep. And he said, oh, you're a lawyer now. Yes. And Ash said, no, I just, I read the rules. I read the laws. All this is my opinion, okay? F sue me. It's my opinion, this is how I feel. Some people, not all people, some people, when they didn't have a lot of uh, vitamin A, when they did not eat a lot of carrots when they were kids, they did not grow tall, right? So some people have that Napoleon effect. You, you're trying to, you know, you're trying to be Chihuahua. You small and you want to be powerful, right? Totally get it. Of course, I told Trilogy Media how obsessed this guy is with me and art specifically, yet he will not subpoena art. Well, guess what? They showed up without subpoenas, and uh, I don't think Lambros was expecting that. It was awesome. Immediately, when that guy turned and looked at Art, you could tell. Like, I know exactly who this kind of person is. Like, just f gross, you know? It's just like, the, the, guy, the guy was just an asshole. He's a slimy guy. So I literally just said, good morning, public defender. And his f gigantic ego did not let him go straight to the court. Oh, you're a lawyer. You're a lawyer. Oh, you're a wrestler. <laughs> you're a wrestler. I remember I'm the black belt in jiu-jitsu, and you're shooting on me now. So you, me and you know that this is, a rap. this is a wrap. He acts like it's the first time he's seen us in the corner, even though he's walking down this long hallway. I never put that together. Oh, hey. Yeah. <laughs> you. L yeah, like what? And then there is Ashton next to me, my brother, right, who loves great conversation, especially especially when those conversations are backing up by law. You know, he reads a lot of, you know, he's he's the, the, the he's supposed to be a lawyer, but he failed and now he's a YouTuber. <laughs> <laughs> and it led to Lambros saying Calling his first swear word. Dumbass. And he was getting kind of close to Ashton, looking up, because he's shorter than me, uh, Lambros is. He was looking up on Ashton, you know, as Art's towering over him, you know, and uh, he's like, oh, you're a lawyer now? Dumbass. That immediately, I was like, oh, he is acting the same. Yep, exactly the same. All, all we said was good morning. At this moment, Michael Lambros briskly turns and walks into what I can only imagine he refers to as his courtroom, only to immediately return with a bailiff, pointing at me like a tattletaling schoolgirl 
and saying, he has a phone, he's recording. And said like, that guy, that guy, that guy. Points at dumbass, which is Ashton, and says, Oh, to the bailiff, oh, he has a phone. He has a phone, he's recording. Uh, Cause Ashton's phone was right here. I had my phone in my shirt pocket with the camera facing outward. And I would imagine that towards the end of that first confrontation, Michael Lambro spotted it. It was at that moment that I promptly stopped recording and I showed the bailiff as such. So Chihuahua is like, you know, like the, 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 f***ing, the white stuff coming from these angry little Chihuahua. Now this brings up a whole nother can of worms. I told you before that I went through the proper channels of the court to request filming of the hearing. I did it exactly the way the court requires. Instructions on lacourt.org's website state, before any media outlet is allowed to photograph, broadcast, and or record in any California courtroom, written authorization from the judicial officer conducting the legal proceedings must be obtained. This is done by filling out and submitting forms MC500 and MC510. The final steps of these instructions are to email the completed MC510 and MC510 forms to the court's communication office at camera requests at lacourt.org at least five days before the scheduled hearing. The hearing was to be on February 1st, and I submitted both of these forms precisely as instructed to in plenty of time on January 24th. However, on February 1st, the day of the hearing, the only response that I had gotten from the court was the day before. And it was only after I had emailed again following up asking for an update. Their response stated, judge will rule at the time of hearing. So as of the hearing time, 8.30 a.m. on February 1st, standing in the hallway, I had not yet been given an answer to this request. Now we, meaning me, Art, Courtney, Chris, and Connor, were the only ones that were on time. Lambros, in common form, showed up about 20 or 30 minutes later, immediately followed by the altercation that you just saw. It wasn't until after that encounter that the DA of the day, Jury Kim, came out of the courtroom to verbally inform me that the judge had officially denied my request of filming. That was then followed later by official paperwork indicating this denial that showed up to my email long after the hearing had already taken place. But this honestly is a completely separate issue. I knew that just because we hadn't yet received an official approval or denial, that didn't mean I could just assume approval. So we didn't bring our cameras. We didn't bring our press passes. We didn't bring any microphones. All we had on us were paperwork and cell phones. Cell phones standing in a hallway littered with signage that says no cell phones, while I can simultaneously see 20 different people on cell phones. My filming of Lambros' behavior was entirely unrelated to my media request of filming the hearing. My filming of Lambros was to protect myself and the people close to me. And I'm saying all this because it is very relevant to what's about to happen. And I'll explain more in a moment. So trying to put that unpleasant encounter aside, we focus on what's in front of us. District Attorney Jury Kim comes out of the courtroom once again to verbally give us some updates about the status of Fernando's charges. She tells us that she's prepared a plea deal for Fernando. And if Lambros comes to an agreement with her, that this entire case can possibly be wrapped up today. She didn't give us the details of that plea deal in the moment, but we were soon after invited into the courtroom to observe the entirety of the hearing. We all enter the courtroom, and we all sit together in one line on a bench where Jury Kim instructed us to. It was me, Art, Connor, Chris, and Courtney all sitting in one line, a couple rows back from the front in the spectator seating section. In front of the spectator seating, there's that little swinging door that I'm sure you've seen in court shows, leading to the attorney tables and what I think is called the well. The defendant's table is on the left, where sat Michael Lambros and Fernando Arteaga, and the plaintiff's table on the right, where Jury Kim sat. And all the way up to the judge's bench, presiding over this hearing, is Judge Serena Murillo, who was not only a superior court judge, but someone who teaches judges by serving as faculty for the California Judicial Council Center for Judicial Education and Research. And in case you missed it before, every single time Chris and Courtney are a part of a hearing in Fernando's case, the judge and DA have been different every single time. And to cut right to it, the only thing I can really say about this hearing is the outcome. I've already requested the official court transcripts from the proceedings on February 1st. I submitted the request on the court's website, as well as called the clerk's office and got the name and direct email of the court reporter on duty in Department 133 on February 1st. The court reporter replied to me and told me it would take up to 45 days to receive the transcripts from the February 1st proceedings. And Considering the outcome of this hearing kind of speaks for itself, we decided not to wait. So here we are. This was actually my first ever experience being in a courtroom before. Um, I did not know what to expect. It was a very large room. You know, it really was. It was a whole, it was intimidating. I was like, this is crazy. This is real. And it actually gave me this crazy feeling about 
the, the videos that we film, that these actually have real repercussions. And these criminals that we get, they're not fake. I need to say that to people, right? Because like, <laughs> like, they're not these aren't fake videos. Like, you can't fake this court case. The proceedings were pretty cut and dry, and they were completely void of any involvement or testimony from Courtney or Chris. Countless threats and accusations, and over $2,000 later, this entire trip across the country for Courtney and Chris was completely and utterly unnecessary. Aside from that, Apart from several condescending glares from Michael Lambros and zero eye contact from Fernando, the rest of this hearing seemed to be pretty by the book. At the very start, Michael, Jury, and the judge left the room for a recess for what felt like over half an hour. I assume they were in the back rooms deliberating the details of the plea deal. Once they finally came back, the proceedings began and so concluded Fernando's conviction. Public defender, DA, and, and the judge Three of them, they went to the back room, right? Lambros, Fernando, the DA, the judge, they all went into the back room to deliberate and I, I think come up with a plea deal. She did say in the beginning, we're gonna try to end this today. I have a deal for Fernando. And we were excited, cause we're, you know, tired of Lambros. <laughs> they were back there for, it felt like an eternity. It's probably 20 minutes. And we all just sat there quietly, you know. In the courtroom. In the, in the courtroom. So when they come out from the back room, uh, Art smiles right at Lambros, and Lambros smiles back at him. Oh, shit. I'm gonna give you an analogy. I'm gonna give you an analogy. This is how public defender get out from the back door after having conversations and probably talking shit about Trilogy Media, of course. The door is open, and he's coming first. You know Irish fighter McGregor? You know his walk? You know that shit, right? That his walk? You know, like cocky as I can beat your shit up with a big Smile. You know, like that, that, that hyena. I thought Ashley's hyena. F him. I was looking straight ahead at Lambros, and I just see him staring at Art. I did not know that Art was smiling at him. I just see him stare at Art with a big smile on his face, and he's staring the whole time he's walking. I'm like, this is awkward. <laughs> Lambros and Fernando took the plea deal, and the deal is as follows. Felony count one, meeting a minor for lewd purposes, would be dismissed. Felony count two, attempted unlawful sexual intercourse, Fernando pled no contest. Pleading no contest, also known as nolo contendere, is very similar to pleading guilty. It's a way of pleading guilty and accepting all of the consequences of a guilty conviction without explicitly admitting guilt. For all intents and purposes, this is a guilty conviction of Fernando for count two. Fernando's sentencing is as follows. Three days in jail, of which which he received three days credit for time already served. He's ordered to do community service, attend a sex offender management program, and two years probation, during which he's not allowed to possess any dangerous weapons, and he must stay a hundred yards away from and have no contact with any children, with the exception of his children and children in his family to which adult supervision is required. Is this a satisfactory sentence? I don't think so, but unfortunately it's not up to me. Let me know what you think down in the comments. Now next up comes the catalyst upon which the rest of this unimaginable day sprouted from. A second confrontation in the hallway with Michael Lambros, of which I also filmed on my phone. But just prior to this, as the hearing was wrapping up, Jury Kim, the DA, was about to walk up to us and show us out. Michael Lambros stands up, leans over to Fernando, and tells him, loud enough for everyone to hear, points to us, and says, wait for these boneheads to leave, and then you can go. We'll just wait for these boneheads to leave, and he points at all of us. And we're like, did he just f call us in the middle of the room? Boneheads? Just in front of the entire court. Like, and it's very loud too, like it was very vocal. The DA comes up to us, and you know, she's like, okay guys, like let's get out of the courtroom, and we'll talk out there, and then Chris says, is that appropriate for him to be calling us names in the courtroom, like, what? Is it normal? that we're getting abused right now, getting calling names in the middle of the court from public defender like this? And she said, no. And I was so glad you said that because like, yes, yeah, something needs to be done. Like this has gone on too long. <laughs> and so we're like, dude, this guy is just like trashing us, like for no reason in front of everybody, in front of the judge. It was just like super, I don't know. It was just, it was weird. Yeah, and the DA then like acts like she heard me and uh, then she went back up to her stand. I was hoping she was gonna say something to the judge, but no, nothing really happened. Despite being a prosecutor for the state of California, Jury Kim strikes me as the least confrontational person you can possibly imagine. And it's, she walked towards the judge 
She looked at the judge, turned around and she walked away and she's like, yeah, I will tell her later. And then I look at this and I was like, are you afraid of her? But then she comes back, she has us come out into the hall. Public DA afraid to speak up and bring that issue to the, uh, to the judge. And then without even addressing it, she comes right back to us and escorts us out, where our conversation with jury continued in the hallway. After a few moments of us expressing once again our concerns with Lambros's behavior as a state employee, as a public defender, an employee of the state, she continued to tell us that she would address it with Lambros. Whatever the hell that means. Lambros comes back out into the hall. He comes out, we're talking to the DA about how he called us boneheads. And while she's talking to us, public defender walk out. So he walking out, and he's on the phone with somebody. Again, with his big hyena smile. He already called us dumbass. He already called us bone hats, assholes, whatever he called us, right? And as we pass Lambros, Art whispers to him, good job, Chihuahua. And I said, you know what? I'm gonna give him a nickname. I'm, he, he must know the nickname that I give it to him. And I'm, a, you know, I have a dog. I'm an animal lover. I love dogs more than people. People suck. That's why you should have a dog. There is a specific breed that eat its own owners. It's a little, little chihuahua. Right? It's that, it's, 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 you sleep, they eat you. They're little Napoleons and I love them, but they're gonna eat you. So he's talking on the phone again with his arrogance, with a big smile, that hyena smile. I pass by, all I have to do, just turn around, Look up, oh, there is no public defender. Look in the middle, oh, there is no public defender. Look down, oh, I found you, Chihuahua. So all I have to do, just like, you know, and everything is happening like this. It's, you know, like when you're passing by a turtle, um, a Toyota Prius on the left, and you're going very far, but you have one second to look who is driving that car, right? So I was passing by the public defender and I like did like this. Good job, Chihuahua. And he kind of like got stumbled a little bit, what I whisper in his ear, and he probably was trying to process if it's a compliment or it's an insult, right? Because I didn't say any names that he called us, I didn't call him asshole, bonehead, uh, dumb shit, whatever, right? Scumbag, right? That's, that's coming. So he throws his balls for a second. And this guy goes, what? What did you say? I said, nothing. Did you call me Chihuahua? I said, oh, no, I did not. And then again, that ego, all you have to do is just like a little, a little friendly poke. Just like, good morning, public defender and hello, Chihuahua. You just have to do with a big smile. And he just f blew up. It was at this moment that I hit record on my phone, not knowing what was about to happen. And here is what happened. That's very inappropriate. I will talk to him. Oh, look at you. Did you call us clowns? No, it was boneheads, actually. Boneheads. No, I called you boneheads. Oh, me bonehead? I was the dumbass. Very inappropriate and unprofessional, Mr. Lambro. So I will, I will address that with him. Um, I, are there any other- Who's in charge? It is inappropriate. Are there any questions that I can try to address for you? No. Other than that, because I'll address that with him. No, just that. Just that would be great. Really great job to you, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. You handle amazing. Thank you. So we're done. And you know, hopefully there's not going to be any more it's okay. interaction. Go ahead and take off. I'll see you guys out. And if there's any other questions, feel free to email me. Okay. Other than that, we're- Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Good job, Chihuahua. Hey, what'd you say, buddy? I didn't say anything. Okay, so... My man, come here. I'm sorry. I didn't hear you. What'd you say? I didn't say anything. So, you complain to her that I call you a bonehead, and you walk by me and call me a chihuahua? You're kind of a scumbag. I'm scumbag? So now it's scumbag. Who's the attorney here? I thought that was you. I'm the attorney. Okay, so that's how attorneys behave. Scumbag, scumbag, scumbag. Yep, that's how attorneys behave. Scumbag? Let's not do that. Let's not do that. He came here to rip a child. You literally, all the job you can find okay, let's is just... defend and go after kids. Okay, let's go. Let's go. That's your job? That's why you're the lowest level of lawyer. You fail as a lawyer. You fail as a lawyer. And jujitsu. Yeah. White belt. Eat some carrots. Maybe you're going to grow as a man. Let's go. Let's go. You're going to be taller. Next life, you're going to be taller and not chihuahua complex. It was a scene. One that the entire 15th floor was now privy to. He called him an endearing name, Chihuahua. Who doesn't love Chihuahuas? <laughs> so Art was just letting him know he did a good job. Like, 
scumbag, 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 scumbag. You kidnap, you kidnappers. I don't know what happened, but Lambros then, hey, what, what did you say? Hey, buddy, buddy. Hey, buddy, what like, did you say? And we're all walking and this guy starts like following us. And there's all these people in the hallway of the courtroom. Like it, the whole thing is packed of people. And this guy is like now making this very public incident. He's like, what did you say? What'd you say about me? What'd you call me? And it's so funny because he was calling us names since 9 a.m. It started with Ash, dumbass, then boneheads, you know? He made the first name call. He was the one who like really wanted to get things going. You could tell this guy just wants controversy. He wants like, he wants attention. He craves it. He's, he's dying for it. Sorry that Art congratulated you and called you Chihuahua, because you are an ankle biter and you're short. Juri Kim, she's she's trying, she's between two uh, uh, fires. She's trying to handle the situation. I kind of felt bad for her at this moment because she was sort of in the middle of all this and she's like trying to break every everything up. Like, because Michael is just, he keeps yelling and then Art's, you know, he's just talking back. He's like, come on, like, what do you, what do you want? You're Chihuahua, you know, you're a little Chihuahua keep barking, you know? Scumbag, 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 scumbag. It's like, what? You're an attorney. He works for the state and he's in a high position. He needs to be held to a high standard. He needs to act professional. Be the bigger person in those situations. He called a Chihuahua, walk away, dude. Be a professional. But no, he kept trying to escalate it and make it worse. And the fact that he can treat witnesses like this, again, we're just witnesses. Who cares? You know, he's calling us names, Art calls him a name, he wants to make this whole scene in front of the hallway. It's, it was just unbelievable. It's like, this guy just needs a little bit more class. He obviously does not have it. So we, we have like verbal uh, conversation in the hallway and, and Kim, she, uh, Jury Kim, she just pushes to towards the elevator. He's like, guys, like what's going on? And we said like, listen, I know this is your first time on this trial, but he was very abusive. He, you've done a lot of stuff. He did witness intimidation. He just, he made witness life miserable. The worry is he's gonna treat other witnesses like this. Let's say the next person that he is representing, you know, let's say, you know, he did rape an actual 13 year old. Are you gonna treat this victim slash witness like that on the stand in the hallway and then she's too afraid he or she is too afraid to show up next time so they do get a bench warrant you know they do get a warrant you know that's bullshit all because of witness intimidation and it was at this moment that i knew something else had to be done in our continued gripes to jury as we all made our way to the elevators i told jury that i filmed lambros and that I wasn't ashamed that I did. And it was me admitting to jury that I filmed Lambros in the hallway that initiated an entirely new wave of heat that was about to come my way. Do I regret telling her? No, because I believe that had I not told her and I proceeded as I was planning to, it could have ended up a lot worse for me than it did. We would have gotten arrested had we not shown up. Okay, so we showed up, guess what happened? We got belittled, we got called names, you know, we got followed in the hall yelling, you know, insulting people I really care about, which is Trilogy, you know, um, the people that got us here. And we, we did that whole bus together. He was doing all of this to us after his client was found guilty. Congratulations, he is now a registered sex offender. You lost the case. You lost the case, I get it, you're mad, but don't take it out on us. Nobody's standing beside him except Lambros. He was even patting his back and stuff. Oh, it was just weird. Disgusting. I believe sunlight is a damn good disinfectant, hence the existence of this entire video. And yes, I know it's the real crime of the century, but did I break the rules by filming in the courthouse hallway? According to them, yes. According to me, perhaps. But my reason for doing so was with good cause and substantial justification, which is a permissible exception to this rule as stated in this very court's general order for filming but we'll get to that in a minute. And beyond that, I'm not a lawyer, but I do know that generally speaking, filming in public is a constitutionally protected activity. When you're on public property and there is no reasonable expectation of privacy, there is no law that prohibits video and audio recording. I also know that the courthouse is a public building and I'm a resident California taxpayer. And finally, I do know that the courthouse is littered with signage prohibiting audio and video recording without prior written consent. So I know there's a line, but its location is a bit unclear. Maybe I did break the rule, and I was more than happy to accept the consequences for doing so, because I felt in that moment that it was the right thing to do. 
and I will never apologize for that. I'm so happy Ash took that video in his pocket because we needed it to prove the kind of person that Lambros is. But when talking to the DA after court, it got brought up that Ash was recording and he was honest with her. I did record. So she said, well, you cannot record and blah, blah, blah. I need to bring this um, piece of information that I just found out uh, to the judge. I'm like, okay, sounds good. Now, I figured Jury was gonna tell the judge that I recorded. I figured she'd tell Lambros too. I can't help but speculate that these people frequently work together every single day and have a vested interest in looking out for one another. But I don't blame Jury. She's doing what she feels she's supposed to do by the book. I get it. But from my perspective, in regards to the Lambros situation, we have already tried doing it the right way in the eyes of the court. Courtney has already filed complaints with Lambros's supervisor, as well as each DA along the way throughout this case. That got nowhere. She testified in previous hearings that she's experienced threats and witness intimidation by Mr. Lambros. That got nowhere. Courtney and Chris also filed an official complaint with the State Bar of California. And that got nowhere. I'll leave this up here if you want to pause and read the whole thing, but it clearly cites several rules of the state bar that Lambros has violated. Rule 3.2, delay of litigation, prolonging the proceedings to cause needless expense of witnesses he had no intention of questioning with the purpose of wasting their time and causing them needless expense. Rule 4.1, truthfulness in statements to others. Mr. Lambros made false statements of material fact or law to us in the course of representing his client, misrepresenting the law regarding his power to affect extraterritorial arrests in Wisconsin and the enforceability of his subpoenas. And rules 8.4 C and D, misconduct. Mr. Lambros engaged in conduct involved involving dishonesty, fraud, deceit, or reckless or intentional misrepresentation, and conduct that prejudicial to the administration of justice that included witness intimidation. I've seen it for myself, as did five other people, and I captured it on film. But wouldn't you know, a reply a few weeks later from Roy Kim from the Office of Chief Trial Counsel of the State Bar of California was a letter stating that based on their evaluation, they are closing the complaint. Pause if you want to read this whole letter, but essentially it's saying that it is misconduct for an attorney to commit an act involving moral turpitude, dishonesty, or corruption, but there are insufficient facts supporting Courtney's contention that Lambros engaged in misconduct. Hmm. If only there were more proof. Proof that we had. Proof that I was threatened to be thrown in jail for capturing. The state bar has a whole f flow chart about how they handle these investigations, and this one didn't even get past the review stage. If you have any questions about this process, you may contact trial counsel Roy Kim at the phone number or email provided. For these reasons, the state bar is closing this matter. But they'd love if you'd complete a short survey. Go f yourself. Thank you. Connor. Do you know what's- you I know, take it back. He's a bitch ass bitch. Yeah, <laughs> he's the king of the bitch ass bitch. bitch. You know what's so interesting? Yeah. That because when I passed him and I said, good job, chihuahua, chihuahua. <laughs> and I passed him and he just tried to process uh -huh. if it's a compliment or it's not. Yeah, yeah. And he's on the phone and then he was like, wow, what does this mean? Chihuahua, is it good? No, he called me chihuahua. How did you call me? <laughs> <laughs> Which it doesn't, he's the attorney. He works for the state. He should be better behaved than that. Wow. Regardless yeah, of real. what we say, yeah. we're civilians. Yeah. Know how to f handle wow. yourself. Do your job. What a f tool. Yeah, he was a real asshole. Whispering, turn around, laughing, and I like let. Yeah. When he saw us, when he came back from the judge, he looked at me and I was like, Yeah, I saw And that, I look at him. A little smirk. Wow. So good. Well, they're gonna meet up with us later. So we're. Yeah, let's go. Yeah. yeah. What are you, a lawyer now, dumbass? <laughs> better one than you. What are you, a lawyer, dumbass? Fucking dumbass. Uh, dude, he went a lot of Oh my god, guys. So this brings us to later that afternoon. We're back at our sting house that we were running simultaneous to all this, busting more predators, which is orgasmically ironic considering Lambros hates us for doing that, but the only reason Courtney and Chris were here and able to do more catches was because of him. Lol. While a predator is on his way to the house, I receive a call from a local Los Angeles number. I usually don't answer numbers that I don't have saved as contacts, but something told me I needed to pick this one up. The Fernando finally got prosecuted. He got what he deserved. We wish, you know, the judge can give him more, but it is what it is. He's gonna have his criminal uh, record and all this stuff. So we drove to, um, to our sting house, getting ready for very bad, his name was Alex, very bad uh, child predator who sent a lot of nasty, horrible stuff to 13 years old. And all of a sudden, Ash is receiving a phone call. He picks the call up and it's Jerry, the DA. I was wondering if you could come back to court at 3 o'clock this afternoon. 
The judge knows that you recorded. I did explain to her sort of the name calling that occurred. And, you know, we kind of want to address this whole situation. Would you be available to come back at 3 o'clock this afternoon? The major problem is, you know, you recorded in the courthouse, which is against the rules. So she wants to address that. But I do want her to know sort of what occurred outside between you and Michael Lambros. Because I wasn't there for it. And he was sort of giving his side of the story. I mean, technically, you know, like I said, you're not allowed to record. Mr. Lambros gave his side of the story. Can we set up Zoom? Like we, this is the whole day. I mean, I, I can go by myself, I don't mind. Um, no, we can go together. Um, it's, it just... You are going to get reprimanded for filming. Judge uh, Serena Murillo would actually wants to have a word with you. And so we're all thinking, what? Like, wait, like they want Ashton to go back to the courthouse and have a word with the judge for filming on his phone? So that was kind of weird. So we're like, uh, this seems like, I don't know, like this could maybe be like a setup. Like that sounds like a freaking trap is going on. Like what? We have to go back to the, to the freaking the same building, to the same judge to explain ourselves? Well, it's, we should have kept it to ourselves, not saying anything, um, but it uh, looks like this uh, little face is keep, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. He went back and cried and said his story. Now we tell our story. His side of the story, yep. Um, no, we're going all together. You're not going by yourself. No, we're going all together. And Ashton, he was like, yeah, I can go by myself. And I was like, are you f crazy? No, we all gonna go together. Ash, at first he's like, I'm gonna go alone. And we're all like, dude, no, you're not. You're not gonna go alone. Like, we're all gonna go with you to support you if you're gonna go talk to this judge right now. If you're not available, next available day could be um, a Valentine's Day, February 14th. And we're like, okay, we will get back to you. So we're like, what the heck just happened? Should we do it right now? Should we go on February 14th? Now at this point in the game, my feelings are, I'm already in this far and there's no turning back now. I had already accepted the fact that I might face consequences for doing what I did, and I was okay with that. I then placed a call into our entertainment attorney's office, Pierce Law Group, who replied and tended to this immediately. My name's Aditya Ezuthach, and I'm the managing partner of Pierce Law Group, a boutique entertainment firm based in Beverly Hills, California. I joined the firm three years ago, but the firm was founded by David Albert Pierce, over 25 years ago. What is the proper way to say your last name? You know, it's funny, like, label it Esquire, yeah, I brought my business card. Let's see what it says. <laughs> I remember. Is that the one that you hanged to? Uh... <laughs> this is the one I handed to the judge that prompted her to say, are you even a lawyer? <laughs> They aren't sponsoring this video, nor are they paying us or discounting our rate to say this. We are extremely grateful and fortunate to have them representing Trilogy Media. Pierce Law Group used to be run by a man named David Pierce, whom I met in 2013 when he gave me a job as one of his assistants. I was desperate to leave my miserable job at Blockbuster and I got an interview with David. I knew nothing about law, but I was eager to learn and I even showed him a magic trick. David would just hire someone if he liked them. I came to understand that David knew people, he cared about people, he made his judgments based on how people behave. Despite him not having any full-time positions available at the time, he called me the next day and told me that I won him over with my magic and that he would create a full-time position for me if that's what it took to get me out of Blockbuster. And I used to have a really heartwarming voicemail from him that I had saved all these years, but for some f***ing reason with one of these latest iOS updates, I no longer have any of my saved voicemails prior to 2020. So life hack, if you're like me and you like to save voicemails from loved ones, get them off your phone and email them to yourself. It's touching that Ashton's experience with David made him a client in the end. Uh, when he launched his own company with art. While we were at the People's Call Center last year in 2023, I received the news that David had passed away from cancer. He had kept his diagnosis mostly to himself, which is why the news came as such a surprise to me and many of his peers. Sadly, we lost David last summer in July of 2023. But the firm of Pierce Law Group continues on, having repped and protected Trilogy Media since its inception in 2016, helmed by an amazing team, including Tony Hanna and Aditya Ezithachin. He was one of the best people I've ever met. And you might think, well, you mean for a lawyer? No, he actually was someone who was motivated by just a basic moral code. And I wasn't sure if that was possible in the legal profession or Hollywood for that matter. 
So February 1st, you know, it started like any day, and that was the first I'd heard of it. Ashton and Art reaching out and saying, hey, can we, we have a situation? I wasn't sure what to expect, and it was clear that this was uh, an emergency. This was something that had to be taken care of immediately. Shout out to Aditya, Trilogy's entertainment lawyer. This guy was amazing. Ashton and Art give him a call right away. The second that the call from Jury comes in, Aditya gets on the phone with Jury, and they kind of figure out okay, why Why does the judge want Ashton here? Is this some kind of like setup or something? Like is Ashton just walking into just handcuffs right now? So we were immediately struck that this was an atypical request from the court. You know, we're, we're used to receiving a complaint. We're used to receiving a demand letter. We're used to being given time to respond. This seemed like a call from to go down to the principal's office immediately, the same day. We also understood that this was an objection to filming, knowing what you do is, you know, has generally more protection in fair use and First Amendment. And knowing that uh, Trilogy Media, in this video and in others, you're exposing corruption sometimes, we are, we were curious, like, what is going on here? There's a black and white rule in the court. You just can't film in the courthouse. This is a long-standing rule, although it's been amended from time to time. It, it was helpful to understand this, like, being pulled over by police rather than uh, a formal hearing in a court. There is suspicion of that a law or a rule was broken, and now we're doing an informal, formal investigation. Uh, instead of a police officer standing next to your car, it's a judge. Having agreed with Aditya's recommendation, I'd rather fulfill the request, show good faith, and figure out what it is that we have to do to resolve this today, rather than simmering in the fear of the unknown for God knows how long. Despite my opinions about the filming rules, I had already made peace with the fact that I would face some consequences for filming those videos. My only concern, and the concern of my attorney, was what exactly were those consequences going to be? I was fully prepared to get a citation, receive a misdemeanor charge, or even spend the night in jail. I've never been arrested before, but I would gladly be arrested any day of the week if it was a direct result of me doing what I thought was right. And this was precisely that. I'll spend a night on a metal mattress with a huge smile on my face if it means that I can proceed with the evidence that I've captured and exposing this vile piece of shit to the public. The public that he's paid to protect. But what I don't want is a felony on my record or a prison sentence, because you know, we've got more videos to make. It might seem a bit extreme, but it was made very clear to me that this was very much in the realm of possibility. While we figure out all this lawyer situation about what happened, what's going to happen to Ashton, Chris said like, hey guys, uh, child predator is five minutes away, so let's not forget why we're here. Are we doing it or not? So I tell Aditya, let me call you right back. And we had one of the most disgusting and dangerous predators we've ever seen show up mere seconds later. That video drops the exact same day that this video you're watching does, but it's exclusive to Trilogy Plus. So if you're watching this, head over to Trilogy Plus and watch the season two premiere of Trilogy vs. Predator. And you can now watch it with the added knowledge of our situational stress completely separate from the issue at hand. We just got start rolling our uh, cameras and Knock, knock, knock. Alec is ready, horny with a knife for a child. We caught the bastard, finished our calls, and not that I was surprised, but the team would not let me go back to the court alone. Courtney had to hang back because the cops still had questions about the predator we just caught, but Art, Connor, Chris, and myself got back in the car and trekked all the way back to 210 West Temple Street. Going to court, if you're not used to it, it is inherently an intimidating situation. I, you know, we weren't sure what to expect. The DA did say the judge wanted this on the record, so I had an inkling that we were just gonna be sitting in open court. Shout out to Aditya for not only tending to this issue immediately, but accompanying us to the courthouse. We don't get too much information, but basically Aditya is like, hey, let's go. I'll go with you. I'm gonna drop everything I'm doing to go to this courthouse with you guys and represent you guys. And I don't think anybody expected us to have a lawyer in one hour. Judging by Lambros and Jury's reaction, I'm sure they weren't expecting me to show up to court with counsel with less than an hour's notice. We got there, we met up with Ash and Art's lawyer. As soon as we arrived at apartment 133 on the 15th floor, Jury Kim comes out of the courtroom, meets us in the hallway once again, 
and hands us this. It's a general order from the court about filming rules in the courthouse. She also informed us that before we enter the courtroom and speak with the judge, we needed to choose one of two options. Option one is I can agree to delete the videos completely off my phone and we can resolve this issue today. Or option two, I refuse to delete the videos and I will then face serious consequences for being in contempt of court. It's it's so simple the, from, from their lawyer standpoint, so simple to get out of this. They want you to delete the video, just delete the video, say you're sorry, move on. But Ash knows how important this video is, this clip is, and how corrupt it would be to just get rid of that clip and never be able to show it to the public and let Lambros continue to act the way that he does. So we sat there for a long time trying to build up the argument to keep this video, and they kept us waiting. They said, be there at three. It was four and we still were not in that courtroom. You have to delete the video, that you, that recordings that you did inside of the building, that you're not supposed to do it. And if you're not gonna do it, this is what's gonna happen to you. Jury gave us some time to ponder, and our first step then was to go through the general order in detail to see exactly what we're potentially facing. My thought process at this point was still, as long as my consequences don't exceed a citation, a fine, a misdemeanor, or even a night in jail, throw it at me so I can expose this most of this general order explains what constitutes filming, why filming isn't allowed, and what can happen to you if you do film in the courthouse. But Aditya pointed out something very interesting on this order. Security personnel or a peace officer who has reasonable cause to believe a violation of this order has occurred are requested to prepare an incident report. And if the circumstances warrant immediate corrective action because the person persists in violating this order despite being informed of it or has violated the order in a way that appears to have a significant adverse impact upon court security, or the fair and orderly resolution of cases shall take possession of the device and bring the person without unnecessary delay to the courtroom judicial officer, nearest available site judge, district or discipline supervising judge, assistant presiding judge, or presiding judge as may be appropriate. Which is exactly what's happening right now, despite there being no instance of it having a significant adverse impact upon court security or the fair and orderly resolution of cases. To determine if there is sufficient cause to believe there has been a violation of this order without good cause or substantial justification. Without good cause or substantial justification. I have very good cause and very substantial justification. A state employee of the court is abusing his power, name calling in a court of law, and exhibiting attorney misconduct by threatening us and making false accusations on record. The VA says like, hey, it was an accident before, he did have this unprofessional behavior with other clients, right? Uh, uh, Jury Kim said. So the judge want to know more. Like we want to hear what happened. His supervisor is going to be there. If you have problems, you can file a report. And we're like, we already filed a report twice. She came back to us and she said like, okay, Whatever decision you guys made, uh, it's time, let's go. Now I was more than happy to walk in there and explain all of this to the judge very confidently, but the only question that really remained was, what could they do to me? To what extent are they gonna play this card? Well, if we're speaking technically, which we have to be, the state of California considers contempt of court to be a criminal charge and could very well involve a jail or prison sentence. The worst case scenario would have been a misdemeanor offense uh, that could have been up to $2,500 in, in a fine and up to a year in, in the statute says county jail or state prison. They also said they could bring other civil claims against you, so it could have been a lot more in terms of money damages if that could be proven out. But thirdly, just a contempt order. They might have just thrown you in jail uh, that night immediately. For, uh, for violating the contempt order. So knowing that uh, Ashton can be stubborn, uh, but stubborn in order to fight for the cause, it was important to, to look these things up and to, to make sure we're advising the client adequately. Jerry Kim comes back into the hallway to speak to us briefly one more time before appearing in front of the judge, and she wants to know what our answer is. And we told her, right now, there is no answer until I speak to the judge and plead my case. So in we went. The whole thing is intimidating, I'll admit it. Even a little intimidating for me. I have practiced in a court in another state. Uh, in California, my practice has been completely transactional. So this was a little bit unfamiliar and I needed some of those uh, feelings to come back very quickly. I think Ashton might recall that one of my colleagues was 
He was getting very frustrated that uh, Ashton wasn't just caving on this immediately. He's the one who immediately looked up the statutes and sent them to us. I wondered if you could hear Carter on the phone. <laughs> I'm like... I heard it because I was sitting next to you. You were sitting there. I heard it. Based on your yes. face, I knew what he was saying. Yeah. Yeah. He was just screaming. Yeah. <laughs> Tell him to delete the photo! It's like, Carter, you're not going to jail. <laughs> Ultimately, we, we just have to provide the information. We provide our recommendation based on our analysis. And the client has to make that difficult decision at times. Once again, having already officially requested the court transcripts from February 1st, yet being told it could take up to 45 days, I regrettably only have my perspective to offer as to what transpired in there. Oh, and Art's, and Connor's, and Courtney's, and Chris's, and Aditya's. I will eventually get these transcripts because they are available to the public, and once they're ready, you'll be able to see word for word what transpired in that courtroom. We walk into the courtroom, and I honestly, I swear to God, I thought that we were just going to go, and it was gonna be like a little room or something, maybe like the judge's office, and we are just gonna go like sit in the judge's office, and the judge was gonna be like, hey, Ashton, like you can't do that. I was completely mistaken. I felt lured there. Going into this, I had the impression that this was gonna be somewhat informal. Perhaps we'd have a quick one-on-one -on -one with the judge in between hearings. No, this in and of itself was a hearing. I thought we might sit in the gallery, but they immediately call us up front. So that intimidation level ramps up a little bit. We walk into the, the same courtroom where Fernando was, and they call Ashton up like to sit at the the stand, like at the stand basically to like present his himself. And I was like, this is like a real court case and there, there's no court number, there's no nothing on this. Like they just brought Ashton in and there's people everywhere in the courtroom. Like, like it was a full courtroom. It was crazy. There was so many people there. We're given an opportunity to speak. That's why we're there. And that's, you just want to be concise. You want to be respectful. And I will say the judge, she, was not just professional on top of it she was she was explanatory she didn't have to do that judges don't often do that we all walk in together and judge serena murillo says which one of you is mr bingham and i raise my hand and then the judge separated us a little bit she told me and aditya to walk through the swinging door and to have a seat at the prosecution's table meanwhile everybody else has to remain back in spectator seating we go in there and there's lambros on one side and the da on the other side and there's the judge up there and i'm like going all together, right? We're all together. And the judge like, okay, so who is uh, Mr. Bingham? And actually he was like, me. All right, so pointing at me like, you, you have to sit over there with the, with the, with, with the audience, right? You not, not here, not with the hearing area. And I was like, okay. So I sit down like this. And uh, so our lawyer, Ashton, hats over here. And my head was over there. I was sitting like this, the all hearing, I was like, like this. So I can see her face and she clearly can see me. And I shit you not, the number of people in this room, the tone of the room and the tension in the air, this hearing now felt infinitely more intense, more emotionally driven and more criminally heavy than the hearing against Fernando, the child predator. There were several people present in this room and what I recall to be at least four different bailiffs. During the final decision court against child predator, right? We have a one bailiff. When we showed up for just a meeting, just to speak to the judge, we have what, three, four, right? As well as Michael Lambros at the defendant's table, whose cocky attitude couldn't be more palpable if he had his feet up on the table. Then the proceedings began. The judge starts by calling the hearing, having Aditya introduce himself, and then continues to explain in a lot of court lingo why we're here. She knew that I'm not usually, uh, I'm not a criminal defense attorney, so I'm not in her court. Um, she did ask me if I had a license to practice law in California, which may seem very condescending, but it's not. She needs to make sure that I'm barred before this court. That's just part of her duty. And I will say as a lawyer, it is a skill when in a court to not take offense to things because it's hard to remain respectful to the court. Um, if you if you can't keep your cool. Ash is up there with his lawyer and the judge goes through a long explanation of why you can't record in the courthouse. It looks like Ash murders somebody. Somebody take a knife and just slaughter that, that f public defender. It was like, all of these, because of these? All right, cool. I would have freaked out. I know that. I was thinking about that. I was, I was, 
I sat back in my chair, you know, on the little bench that they have in the back, and I was like, thank God I'm here, because if I was up where Ashton is, that's a scary position to be. And he's got to speak in front of the judge and all of these people right now. So I was like, Ash, don't worry about it. You got this. This is your area. You know, everything that law and everything that you've been studying, criminal justice, this is your time to shine. It's a big aquarium. It's a lot of sharks and fishes flying. You're a shark as well. Go and be you. We just stipulated that, yes, filming had occurred. We pointed out Ashton is the one who actually told the DA that he had filmed, that the reason for filming was not related to a prior request for uh, media to, to be able to film in the courthouse. This was due to a specific situation where Ashton felt his uh, safety might have been compromised, that someone was approaching him aggressively, and he was just concerned about his, his welfare at that point. I'm excited to get this transcript, and I invite you to request it as well. Because at this moment, filming this right now, I can't tell you verbatim what she said. But I can tell you what message I was receiving. She explained at nauseum about filming in the courthouse being prohibited, how she as the judge has full and final control over not just the courtroom, but the hallways as well. She explicitly stated multiple times that she has no interest in hearing why I was recording. She had no interest in hearing anything about our previous encounters with Lambros. She says, I don't want to hear anything about the altercations between you and Lambros, but I think that's BS because that's an important piece of the puzzle. All that mattered was that I broke a rule. I don't give a shit why you did it. The fact that you did it what bothers me because I am the judge, this is my law, this is my, this is my building, this is my room, you did it, and whatever happening between two of you, None of my business. And I was like, hold on one second. Jury Kim specifically said, please come to the court so the judge can hear your opinion, your side of the story. Because this little chihuahua went over there, barked and cried to the judge and said probably how piece of shit we are, how unprofessional we are, how blah, blah, blah we are, in his opinion. What is our opinion? And she made it very clear that I was court ordered to delete those videos off my phone in front of the bailiff and explicitly stated multiple times that it, quote, not be uploaded to YouTube. This unofficial meeting was specifically making sure that it's not gonna be on YouTube. And the judge said several times, delete and make sure it's not gonna go on YouTube. There's not a doubt in my mind that these people know who we are and they know what kind of PR damage we could possibly do. But at this moment, we were in their playground. So I had no option but to play by their rules. The video you're watching now, this is our playground. And I'm so grateful that you're here with us. She kind of shut me down when I started to go into the discussion about Ashton's state of mind. Because she wanted me to say on the record what, what we were happy to say on the record, that filming had occurred. She continued by saying that if I did not comply with these orders, she would seize my phone right here and now, and she would be scheduling me for a contempt of court hearing at a later date, where I would be facing criminal charges and potential jail time. And it was at this moment right here that I had a realization. It was up until this moment that I was fully prepared to deny this order. I was fully prepared to accept the consequences and fight this thing to the death so I can expose this scumbag lawyer to the world. But while she's saying all this, an epiphany dropped on me, like a bucket of ice water on my head. I realized that I'm sitting here being threatened with criminal charges and jail time over a cell phone video of a public defender's inappropriate behavior. My freedom is being threatened in this moment in a manner way more serious than that of a sex offender just earlier that day. They would rather throw me in jail, waste countless dollars prosecuting me. Meanwhile, Fernando only gets three days in jail. This video hitting the public could be pretty damaging to their image, and they're threatening to incarcerate me over it. A video. And the fact that I'm sitting here, maybe about to be arrested, speaks more volumes than the video itself. This part of the story adds such a valuable element to the story we're telling by demonstrating not only the severity of the behavior that was captured, but the extent to which they'll go to steal it from me and keep it private. This fact is arguably more sad, yet groundbreaking, than the simple existence of the video in and of itself. So I made a decision in that moment. I'll comply. I'll play your game. 
I'll delete the videos from my phone, but not before I say my piece. She then let Ashton speak, or Ashton jumped in, and I think Ashton thinks what he said didn't matter very much, but I think it mattered a lot, because she was willing and ready to hear him speak about his state of mind. She gave him more latitude than she would have given me, but I do think it, it made more of an emotional appeal that Ashton just explained why he pulled out his phone and started filming in that instance. So she got from me the factual basis, she got from Ashton, you know, the, the emotional truth behind the actions. Now mind you, at this point, we're maybe 15, 20 minutes into this thing, I hadn't yet spoken. Other than Aditya speaking and answering a couple questions, up until this point, the only one that had spoken at all was Serena Murillo. But there came a moment, and I can't remember if she gave me a moment to respond myself, or if I just chimed in anyway, but I said my piece, and I said it confidently. There are some things about Ashton right? He's so good with words because when he got up there and he started speaking, it was like inspiring. And he said in short sentences and every single sentence, it was billed like, like it's coming from a lawyer. Every single sentence was like so professionally organized. I wish you not f here so I can say good things about you, but f Ashton. <laughs> I'll need that transcript to tell you the words, but I can tell you right now how it felt. It felt great. I told Serena Murillo, yes, your honor, I did film Mr. Lambros in the hallway, and I'm not sorry that I did. I willingly admitted this to the DA, and I'm not sorry that I did. As a representative of the state, Mr. Lambros right there should be embarrassed about his behavior. He has repeatedly threatened us, called us names, exhibited attorney misconduct, and has subjected our colleagues to extreme and undue financial burden. Pursuant to your general order, I felt and still feel that I broke no rules for filming a situation that I had good cause and substantial justification to film. I have no disrespect for the court, and I am here in good faith to answer for the decision that I've made. And if you're ordering me right now to delete these videos off my phone, then I will. I was so proud because I knew exactly who he is and I know that he can put people on their places with a verbal, professional, you know, he's an English speaker and then plus he's practiced that shit, criminal justice bullshit. But then he got kicked out watching a lot of YouTube, remember that? Ashton was brilliant. He got up there and he argued his point to a judge in a very intimidating room. I was scared. Like that would have been crazy to, to stand up there and argue your point in a very respectful way too. I remember watching that and I was like, dude, let's go Ashton. Like this is good, man. Like you f***ing killed it right now. I was so happy for him. What Ash said was powerful and I don't remember at all what he said, but it was good. <laughs> I'll be honest. I don't remember what it was, but I remember at the time like this is great. And maybe, maybe this will make the judge's heart go three times the size like the Grinch. He had like, 69 seconds to shine and he took that 69 seconds and every second he utilized and there was a moment right after i spoke that i felt a tonal shift for the first time it seemed like serena didn't yet have planned what she was going to say next it seemed to me that the extent of Lambros's actions had never been properly explained to her. Surely Lambros was pulling her ear and bad-mouthing us plenty all day, but he would never own up to his own behavior. And certainly Jury Kim wasn't gonna word it in a way that would create any kind of tension whatsoever. It felt like this was kinda new news to her. And even though it didn't change the outcome, I think everyone in that room can attest to her immediate change in demeanor. And the best part, you know what Lambros said? Nothing. He said absolutely nothing. I felt that it got resonated a little bit in her head. Serena then sent a bailiff over to me, watching right over my shoulder, as I deleted two videos from my camera roll as well as my recently deleted folder. Serena then reaffirmed, even with a change in temperament, that our encounters and experiences with Lambros had no bearing here, and that the only thing that matters in the end is that I broke the rule. Ashton agrees, the bailiff comes over, we delete the footage, and in that moment, right, I kind of went from this like super awe-inspiring mood to like, ah, oh, dang, like they got us. Like they definitely got us. Ultimately, I'll also say, although she wanted the footage deleted, she did not infringe on anyone's rights. She didn't say anything about not being able to tell that story, not being able to express everything that happened in that situation that was filmed. She just was following the rule. Frankly, that's what you want to see in a judge. So right before we're about to end, um, she was like, is there anything else? And Art's like, maybe a little bit more professionalism, you know, with your public defenders. And uh, like, 
Remember guys, like the judge only cares about one thing. Did we film or did we not film, right? That's it. So she didn't care about a single other thing. So she cut Art off like right away. And we were like, all right, well, f us. Like, we're, let's leave the court, you know? Everything that uh, Judy Kim said prior on the phone, prior the uh, hearing, nothing was accomplished until Ashton got his little 69 seconds break in and explained really fast, very professional and very res uh, respectful why he did what he did. She also offered to issue a court order for both parties to stay away from each other, which I immediately affirmed that I wanted, and she proceeded to issue said order to Mr. Lambros that he stay a hundred yards away from us and we to him. Serena then wrapped things up and asked if anyone had anything else to say. And this is where Lambros said the only thing he said this entire time, which was asking Serena Murillo to remove the body attachments against Courtney and Chris. Wow, what a good guy. Ashen did not get arrested, which we thought was going to happen. I thought he was going to get arrested. We were all ready for it. We were like, okay, what do we got to do? Ashen was legit willing to just go to the courthouse, submit himself to handcuffs, you know, if it gave him the opportunity to put this video out. I personally witnessed something that should have, should have not been in the first place. I was absolutely embarrassed about where the money goes from tax uh, payers, that people can abuse their power, abuse their profession, and be so unprofessional in the field where actually your job is to be professional. The irony, we can be, let's say, with the most unprofessional people. Let's say we never been to the courts and we just like hard to deal with. Say whatever you want to say. Your job is to be a lawyer to hold together and making sure everything goes according to the law. Law, law, and nobody above the law, including your ass. But it was not the case with Ms., uh, Mr. Lambros. His client went to the house to meet 13 years old girl, a kid. He got naked, he brought knife, he was ready to have sexual uh, relationship. And the way public defender was defending him like we did something to his family, like we did something to his brother, like it was bro his brother was sitting in that court, uh, uh, courtroom. And it's amazing that public defender can defend people and that's his job, publicly defend, regardless of without discriminating, if it's a bad guy, good guy, doesn't matter. Your job is to protect and defend. But the way he treated his title, the way he treated his profession, it was unheard of. I think in reality, it was those three against us or those three against Ash. Oh, wow. There was no sides, there was no leader, it was those three against Ash. It just felt, it felt very corrupt, the whole situation, and I think overall, they don't want this corruption to be out there. They don't want video proof of such corruption. I think so too. To be on the internet. They kept bringing that up, you know, you, uh, you can't have the video on there, you need to delete it, and you can't post it on YouTube. Like, they oh, know, yeah. they know what Trilogy Media does, and yeah. they know that if they post this on YouTube, it's gonna get a ton of views, and it's gonna make Lambros look bad. And it will make the judge look bad for letting that happen in her yeah. courthouse. And it's gonna make the DA look bad for not de defending well enough against Lambros. It's gonna make them all look bad. And looks like everybody were covering him up. Everybody knows that he's a rotten tomato in this jar, but nobody wanna do anything. And that's why the moral of this video, and why, that's why we need, we felt that we need to speak up that this would not happen again. That this, that people can see the video, and again, this is my opinion, your opinion, his opinion, it's, it's he, like him versus him. It's all our opinions, you know, couch opinions, say whatever you want. But what I personally witness in this, the country that I, me coming as an immigrant, the country that I always dream of, the country that I will die for, the dream country, something that I escape my ex-countries that there is no law, you don't believe in police, you don't believe in, in, in justice, and you meet people like Mr. Lembros, and all of a sudden you have a flashback. Where am I right now? So I leave you with this. I complied with the court order. I deleted the videos off my phone 
and I did not post them to YouTube. I would have gladly reached out to Lambros for comment, but I'm court ordered to stay 100 yards away from him and have no contact. Courtney nor us, to this day, have received any travel reimbursement from the court for the February 1st hearing, and we're told by Jury Kim that reimbursement is not guaranteed, despite having that promise on record from a judge in a previous hearing. Jury was actually surprised when we informed her that it was already promised, and my criminal record remains clean, at least until another one of my loved ones gets bullied or threatened again. No one likes anybody who plays dirty. Like, and that's probably how this guy has been his whole f***ing life. You know, he, he can't avoid it at this point. And somehow this guy passed the bar and he's a lawyer now. And he's playing dirty. And I, I don't, th I think that there should be some accountability. This guy is running around name calling. He's just being an asshole. He's subpoenaing everybody. He's just causing such an inconvenience to just still lose the case at the end of the day. It's like the case was already lost when you picked it up. It's like the guy's going to do this over and over and over and over again. That's how he is. He's just a dirty guy. How many witnesses has he done this to and what has he put other people through? We've seen the worst this world has to offer. Oh, yeah. But for somebody who witnesses something bad once, and they're there in court and they're brave enough to go testify and for him to treat him like that. Yeah. At one point, all of our catches were on YouTube from beginning to end, first catch to the most recent, yeah. but now they, because of YouTube's terms of service, they're scattered all over the place. If you wanna see as many catches as you can from us and support this cause, follow Rumbles, Locals, Facebook, Instagram, uh, YouTube, of course, so you can see everything. Make of this what you choose, but this is our story and we're sticking to it. Leave us your thoughts in a comment below and if you enjoyed this video, give us a like and a subscribe. The uncensored version of this video is available at TrilogyPlus.com and in case you're wondering, that doesn't apply to anyone's cock. You can also watch the season two premiere right now of Trilogy vs. Predator and see what other stresses we were dealing with simultaneous to all this madness. You can download the Trilogy Plus app on iOS or Android or simply go to TrilogyPlus.com, create your free account and you can stream the all access seven days completely free. Special thanks once again to Michael Lambros for providing an opportunity for us to make more of these episodes that he loves so much. And if you stick around for 90 more seconds, you can watch the trailer right now. Fucking nice! Go, 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 go.